Planning meeting for June 5th, 2019 will now come to order. Please stand with us for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do you want to do it now? Okay, if you'd go down there, we'll swear you in. Thank you. Good evening. Please place your right hand on the Bible. Raise your right hand, sorry. Raise your right <laughs> hand and left hand on the Bible. My apologies. And repeat after me. I, state your name. Jane Wallace Fidel. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support. That I will support. Protect and defend. Protect and defend the Constitution. The Constitution and government. And government of the United States. Of the United States and the State of Florida. And the State of Florida against all enemies. Against all enemies, domestic or foreign. Domestic or foreign. And that I will bear. Then I will bear true faith. True faith. Loyalty and allegiance. Loyalty and allegiance. To the same, to the same, and that I am entitled, that and I am entitled to hold office, to hold office under the Constitution, under the Constitution, that I will faithfully, that I will faithfully perform perform all the duties, perform all the duties of the office, of the office of the Planning and Zoning Commission, of the Planning and Zoning Commission of the City of Titusville, of the City of Titusville, on which I am about to enter. Ab which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you very much and congratulations. You. you are the newest member to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Please Thank take you. your seat. Please. Chairman Williams. Here. Member Hare. Secretary Chambers. Here. Member Spidell. Here. Member Baker. Member Richardson. Here. Member Seavers. Here. We have quorum. Next is approval of minutes for May 22nd, 2019. Is there any corrections or a motion to approve? I make a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. Any person who is, well, if I'm in the wrong area, we've done this forever. I'm looking for my, where I am. <laughs> All persons who anticipate speaking on any public hearing item must first fill out the oath card to be heard on that agenda item and sign the oath card contained thereon. These cards are located on the table near the entrance to the council chamber or may be obtained from the recording secretary. This meeting will be conducted in accordance to procedures adopted in resolution 24-1997. Those speaking in favor of, re of a request will be heard first, those opposed will be heard second, and those who wish to make a public comment on an item will speak third. The applicant may make a brief rebuttal if necessary. A representative from either side, for or against, may cross-examine the witness. Anyone who speaks is considered a witness. If you have photographs, sketches, or documents you desire the commission to consider, they must be submitted into evidence and will be retained by the city. Please submit such exhibits to the recording secretary. Staff, has all items been properly advertised? Yes, they have. And has anybody on the commission had the opportunity to speak or visit the sites coming before us? Okay. I, I, have, I have previously visited the site on JJ Road, drove by. Okay. Um, with that, we will go to new business. The first item this evening is the uh, conditional use permit three 2019 for a private school. There we go. This is a conditional use permit to at for a private school at 6755 South Washington, which is the New Life Church. There is currently a conditional use permit on this property. It is for child care and the church, and that child care will allow up to 70 students. The request is for a uh, school that would allow, I believe, 
some of those preschool, those childcare students to continue on it into a school here at the church. There is an existing building, there are actually two buildings which total 61,000 square feet and parking for 350 spaces. The request is to allow a private school to occupy the existing building and use existing facilities. There are three recommendations for approval. The first is that an internal traffic circulation must adhere to the routes shown in Exhibit A, and I believe that is here. The second is that a traffic impact study is required if the enrollment exceeds 30 students and that any off-site improvements that were found as part of this traffic study would be completed. And the third is that an, if asphalt parking with expansion is required, that it will be added prior to expansion beyond the kindergarten. for fun. The, um, currently the property has two vehicular access points onto South Washington and there are 356 parking spaces. The site was originally approved for a church and a child care facility by conditional use 3-2015 as I mentioned previously. The church has not expanded by the CUP and the facility is not requesting expansion under the proposed CUP. The con GU zoning district allows schools as a conditional use, which is the reason that this request has been made. In reviewing the land use, consistency with the land use, it is consistent with the ingress and egress requirement because there are existing ingress and egress points on US-1. The fire department did not object to the request and the request is to establish a kindergarten program followed by full expansion to a K plus 12 program. Through discussions with the applicant, the kindergarten class was to be no larger than 30 students. There was a review of nuisance factors. The nearest single family home to the east is approximately 250 feet from the playground with approximately 80 feet of natural vegetation serving as a buffer. Based on the existing conditions on the property, the use is not likely to cause nuisances. The accept, there is acceptable level of service as there is no expansion to the facility proposed. The screening and buffering, this proposed public school, I'm sorry, private school, will utilize the existing building and outdoor play areas. As I mentioned, there is a significant dense vegetative buffer, a minimum of 80 feet in width which is adjacent to the single family uses to the east. Based on the staff's review, uh, there will also be no changes to signage or site lighting proposed at this time. However, if that were to occur, they will be required to obtain the appropriate permits from the city. The land development regulations will also require the proposed use to meet the standards of section 28 255D2 and 28255C1, which include the playgrounds and outdoor recreational areas are set back a minimum of 50 feet, and that their frontage and all access from a collector or highway road, unless the city council approves otherwise. The staff is recommending approval with the three conditions that I mentioned a moment ago. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Ms. Richardson, you had a question? On page three of six or 18 of 68, number four, when it talks about solid waste disposable, potable water or wastewater, it says in the second sentence, solid waste services already provided to the Titusville Mall. The Titusville Mall doesn't have anything to do with this, does it? No, sir, it does not. Thank you for correcting that. That's the reason that Trevor left. He was concerned you'd find that error, so we had to. <laughs> <laughs> Is that it? Yeah. Okay. So we'll open this to the public. Um, we have cards on this. Jason Linkus. Mr. Linkus. Hi. Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm Jason Linkus. I'm a senior pastor at New Life and uh, 
just uh, here to uh, answer any questions or talk talk about this in any way you want to talk about it. But appreciate your time. Uh, how's the uh, preschool going? It's going very well, thank you. Yeah, uh, very great. Um, able to really uh, touch a community there that needed needed that service, so it was really great. Very excited about this uh, this next uh, opportunity to uh, to create this school. The kindergarten uh, getting started right now is is a great thing because we have we now have uh, we've uh, for several years in with the preschool and uh, many of those. Uh, people who are, would be going into kindergarten want to stay in the school, so this uh, makes it possible. Hopefully they just kind of go on up and, and remain a part of who we are. Okay, I have a question. Do Mr. Sievers. Uh, plans to go on into the elementary area? Sorry. <laughs> do you have a plan to go on from the kindergarten to the elementary school? We do, school? we do. We want, we want to continue to, to grow it. Uh, because of um, some of some things that we we needed to get done here with the traffic studies and this and that, if we go a little longer, it's gonna. Uh, that's as we grow, we'll we'll grow with you. And uh, but we we want to uh, to get started. So these these ones who've been with us since infancy uh, can continue on. So it's a beautiful property. Thank you, thank you. We're uh, we're pleased to be there, be a part of this community. Thank you. Based upon the existing facilities, do you have an estimate as far as uh, how large a student population that the facility can accommodate? Well, there's again going to be a lot of uh, a lot of work going into that detail, but we have we do. It's a very large facility. Yes. We have a lot of open areas that we we uh, are able to manipulate uh, and, and to create space within. Uh, the building, I, I believe that we can probably grow all the way up to, uh, we, I think we could do the entire thing in, within our f facility, but we're, we're still working on that exact master plan. And if we would need to expand up beyond that in the future for, for a high school or something like that, maybe we could, uh, we, we'll be talking again, I'm sure. But there, there's a, it's a very big space. You know, we have a lot of nice open spaces and, and a design to, to create a school out of those. But this first part's easy because we have a room right now ready for the kindergarten and uh, we're gonna, we can get started right away. Okay. Uh, Ms. Richardson. You are aware, Pastor, that if you exceed 30 students, you have to provide a traffic study. Yes. Okay. Yes, and we, we, we were planning on doing that. We, the, the, the timing, we, were, we would have done it right now, but from what this traffic study people had said, it was gonna take two or three months to complete that, which would have made it impossible for us to begin uh, this, this uh, in the 2019 school year, which we wanted to do. So we kind of backed it down a little bit and said, let's get started, and, and the staff uh, seemed to uh, agree with that being a, a good plan. Okay, any more questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Are there any more cards? No, sir. All right, so we'll close this to the public. I have a question for staff uh, regarding the um, uh, parking. Um, one of your conditions was if they exceed so many students, they're gonna require, be required to, um, add, is it add additional? If the traffic study shows that additional parking is required, then they will have to do that before they're allowed to do more than 30 students. Okay, so, but realistically, because of the time time of the schools and the existing parking lot, and is that, how probable is that? I'm not Great. a traffic engineer, well, you're but they, they have do three. have a great deal of parking. I think the primary concern for the traffic study was actually the fact that, as you know, picking up and dropping off students can cause congestion. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do is try to understand, tying that in. So right now they have 300 something parking. Not that I'm minimizing what you're saying, but I'm or minimizing the um, condition, but the traffic study is good. It's always good to have, but I, I just don't see how it could possibly add any additional parking given that they have 300 something, the times, 
the changes in the city policies um, with most of the parking. parking is grass parking and the issue is if more asphalt parking is necessary so would would that what would be the benefit of that of having an asphalt parking there there is a requirement that actually the city does not allow asphalt I mean grass parking mm -hmm. so it this was created when it was in the county who did allow that and if additional parking is required, then unless they were to get a variance, it okay. would have to be asphalt. Okay, I understand. All right, um, so this is closed to the public. Is there any more discussion, Mr. Sievers? I think it's understood by the uh, recommendation, but I would respectfully suggest maybe we add a fourth condition uh, which would say student enrollment capacity shall be limited to the existing facility and in compliance with applicable codes and regulations. Uh, I would suggest that be added as a uh, fourth condition uh, since I believe something like that in the CUP is uh, important. Okay. All right, with that uh, suggestion, um, is there a motion? Or would you like to make the motion? Certainly, I'll go ahead and make the motion. Uh, recommend that the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission recommend to the City Council approval with the three conditions outlined by staff as well as the fourth additional one that I just mentioned. Okay, is there a second? I'll second that. All right, can we take a vote on this? Member Spidell? Yes. Member Hare? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Uh, yes. Member Richardson? Yes. Member Sievers? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. All right, motion passes. And when does this go back before council? <coughs> this will go on Tuesday, which is the 11th of June. Okay, there you go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> All right, next item, please. Okay, the next item is the CPA 1 2018 Brooks Landing. You have seen this already. It was for a transmittal to the state for the comprehensive plan part. This is a two part question. First is the comprehensive plan amendment and the second is the rezoning. It is possible to do the comprehensive plan am amendment approval without the rezoning. It is not possible to do the rezoning without the comprehensive plan amendment. This location is North JJ Road. It's approximately 71 acres. The proposed use is 143 single family homes. This is a reduction from the previous project that you saw of 162. This is the proposed and the existing and proposed land use. And what has happened here, what the proposal is to take the PUDZ zoning and to change it to a PD zoning. Also, you'll notice that there are several wetlands in conservation shown on this future land use map as the current land use. The proposed land use would remove those areas from the conservation land use and the protection would be afforded by the master plan for the um, wetlands, except there's a few small wetlands that there, just, that there would be expected to be some impacts. I'll talk about that in a moment. This is the existing and proposed zoning, and you can see that it is going from uh, PUDZ with OR to uh, PD. This map does not show that very well, but it would be basically just PD. This is a survey showing the wetlands. Some of the wetlands that are currently shown as, and I'll show you this, you notice that the green map has, if you look over here, you'll see that there are several green areas. In this case, this wetland survey has been approved by the Water Management District, and the wetlands here as surveyed and ground truth are somewhat different than is shown. The large wetland in the center and the large wetland on the upper right are currently shown as conservation. There is no proposal that those wetlands would be impacted. 
the two small wetlands at the bottom, you can see they're a little bit different based on the survey and that those two wetlands are anticipated to be impacted. In addition to that, there are about three other small wetlands. The total of wetlands expected to be impacted on this property is a uh, little over one acre. Currently, the green areas are about five acres in size. The wetland survey shows there to be a little over eight acres of the property. And of those eight, again, um, about seven acres are expected to be maintained in their current and perhaps enhanced. This is the master plan, which is not significantly different than what you have seen before. The difference is that on the east side that those lots have been made larger. And in addition to that, if you'll notice the cul-de-sac on the upper right hand corner that previously had several uh, properties, lots that were created in that area. Also, you'll notice on the front end, on the entry road, there are two blank areas. Those were previously lots as well. There is, uh, I'll get into that in a moment. Okay, these are the changes. The current planned unit development would allow a lot size of 6,050 square feet. The proposal is for 6,000 square feet. So those would be somewhat smaller. The lot width, 55 feet as compared to the proposed 50 feet. The minimum floor area is 900 square feet under the current PUDZ. That 1,000 square feet should be 1,200 square feet. The applicant has um, recently uh, confirmed that they're willing to have a minimum house size of 1,200 square feet. The front setback under the current PUDZ is 10 feet under the proposed is 20. The rear setbacks are the same. You'll notice the side setbacks are half a foot smaller. Under the current PUDZ, there is no maximum building coverage nor maximum lot coverage. Under the proposal, there are maximum lot coverage of 45%, maximum, I'm sorry, maximum building coverage of 45%, maximum lot coverage of 65%. You'll notice that the open space is essentially the same, minimum of 35% and 36.4%. So uh, let me see. The, on, during the March 12th transmittal public hearing, the applicant stated that they were willing to consider limiting the houses on the eastern border to one story versus two stories, minimum square footage and buffers. And on May 16th, the applicant provided a written commitment to the following. The buffer distance from the rear lot line to the property line to 70 feet along north and east property line is outlined on the plan. Limit one story on lots 97 through 103. And if I could, 97 through 103 are the ones that are on the fur furthermost east. Minimum square footage of houses of 1,200. As I said, there's a reduction of 19 units and a, those are essentially the changes, the layout is essentially the same. Um, based on the prior PUD zoning procedures in effect in 2006, the development would have been required to come back to planning and zoning and city council for two additional rounds of public hearings with a separate conceptual master pr plan, preliminary master plan and final master plan approval. The development standards I discussed with you briefly, and now I'll go over the comprehensive plan review. The summary of the staff's findings are that the properties to the north and east are developed with single family dwellings on larger lots. The land use of the county in this vicinity is residential two at two units an acre, which is the proposed land use. So if you looked at the land use, I think that you would see that the land use is exactly the same. The difference is that in this, pro in this area, many of the lots at the, on the development in the county did not to develop to the half acre minimum. They have much larger lots. 
so the area is more rural in nature than the two units an acre land use would um, lead you to believe. The, there is currently no water and sewer available at the site. The applicant has expressed their intention to extend the nearby water mains to create a loop and extend a force main to the site from Dairy Road. This will actually improve the water system by creating a loop in this area. The developer will extend the utilities at their own expense and will be required to meet all of the um, requirements of the concurrency. The subject property is bordered by single family homes, including some undeveloped residential properties on the northeast and west. There are commercial properties on the east. Some of those are undeveloped as well. With the acceptance of wetlands I and H noted on the survey, which total approximately 0 0.225 acres. Nope, I'm going to correct that. I have, um, I will, ex I'll talk to you about wetlands in a minute. Let's go on to the residential land use. As I said, the residential two uses are, re are the residential land use of two dwelling units an acre is consistent with the residential land use in the area. The, based on the survey provided by the applicant, there are a total of 12 wetlands on the property that range in size from 0 0.2 acres to 3.9 acres for a total of 9.2 acres. The proposed development preserves 8.2 acres of the on-site wetlands. The applicant did meet the neighbors on January 29th, 2019 and met the requirements of that comprehensive plan policy. The developer has also provided an preliminary environmental assessment, which was sent to all of you uh, when we received a copy of it uh, yesterday. The property is located in the city's urban service district, and I've already mentioned that the loop to the water system will be beneficial to the overall water system in the area. There is, um, based on the proposed 143 units, the development has the potential to generate approximately 1,352 vehicle trips. The applicant is updating a traffic study and specific traffic related impacts will be addressed with the submittal of the site plan required as part of the subdivision plan. The property has frontage on JJ Road, which is owned and maintained by Brevard County. The current right-of-way width varies between 40 and 45 feet, which does not meet the minimum standards for a public road per the city's regulations. To remedy this situation, the master plan illustrates right-of-way dedication from the applicant's property to allow the roadway to meet the minimum right-of-way standards as established by the city. The, there are several lots that were removed adjacent to the cul-de-sac at the northeast area of the development, and uh, we would like to see the length of that cul-de-sac reduced because it, it the um, smaller the cul-de-sac, the happier the city is we have a minimum, I'm sorry, a maximum length cul-de-sac. The majority of the property is currently within the zone X flood hazard area which means that it has a 0.2% annual chance of flooding. There, in the environmental study that was provided, there is some discussion about wildlife habitat. There, there is a mention that there is possible, there has been noted that there could be some scrub, I'm sorry, some uh, gopher tortoises and that they expect because this property has been used for or was used for years as a grove that those would be relatively few. In addition to that, they did not see any habitat or trees for nests for uh, eagles and there may be some wading birds because of the presence of wetlands. <laughs> the proposed PD master plan is consistent with the surrounding single family homes 
in that the nature of the single family use. However, the surrounding development, while it is of a similar density, the character of the area is, as I said, somewhat rural. The master plan currently illustrates a minimum of 20 foot perimeter buffer around all property lines. And this is somewhat smaller than the current binding develop or the binding development plan that was originally proposed when the property was annexed. It is, however, the um, 70 feet is, however, greater than that which you saw the first time. The internal roadways may be privately maintained and there will be internal sidewalks and trail amenities which will be connected to a sidewalk that the developer will install on JJ Road. The common open space includes both passive picnic areas or walking trails and active recreation playground areas. Private water bodies and stormwater retention or detention areas that are designed to be used for passive recreation may be counted toward the common open space. The plan currently illustrates four foot wide pedestrian recreational trails with park benches and a jogging trail in the common area, as well as a pavilion next to a stormwater recreation pond. The um, process should this move forward is that a sketch plat would be required for review at a later date. And then that would then come to this uh, group as a recommendation before it was seen by the city council. Again, to reiterate that on May 16th, the applicant provided a written commitment to do the following. Buffer distance from the rear lot line to the property line to 70 feet along the north and east property line a limit to one-story homes on lots 97 through 103, and a minimum square footage on all homes 1,200 square feet. Should the uh, recommendation be to approve this, the staff would recommend the following, that those three conditions be included as well as to reduce the length of the cul-de-sac in the northeast corner of the property adjacent to lots 107 and 108, that the master plan should include trails, outdoor pavilions, and other recreational amenities in exchange for reducing the lot sizes to 6,000 square feet, and that would be for the benefit of the restaurant, um, the residents. At a minimum, the installation of a playground or a 30 by 30 foot pavilion should be included in track I across the street from the pavilion illustrated in track E. The water line main lines should be extended to create a loop from the terminus of the existing water main on US-1 and extending north to the intersection with JJ Road and then east of JJ Road connecting to the existing water main that extends through the chain of lakes. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Um, Ms. Richardson, um, you sent this to us, I think, yesterday. I Is that when you got it? That's when I received it, yes, sir. But it's dated date of May, which is a month before we met last and considered this. Would it have made any difference to receive it prior to March the 6th when we talked about it last? I do not know whether it would make a difference to you. If you're asking would it make a difference to the, the staff, staff, I believe that the wetland impacts that were discussed in that project are discuss the fact that the wetlands that are impacted are relatively small in size, going from about two, less than a tenth of an acre to about two tenths of an acre for a total of one acre. So I don't believe that that would have changed anything. The, the discussion of the um, wildlife seemed to say that there were probably gopher tortoises, and there may be some habitat for wood storks that would have to be managed. Again, those two things are not within the purview of the city as far as the requirement or how those are mitigated. So I'm not sure that they that would have made a big uh, issue. I think that the issue here is 
far more compatibility, and I think that that's been the thrust of the discussion. Okay. Okay. Um, was that it, Mr. Richards? Yeah. All right. I had right a couple questions that I wanted to ask before we open it up to the public. First one was the um, the roadway, and I wanted to understand. So we're acknowledging that the roadway here is not large enough to accommodate. Is it supposed to be 50 feet and it's 45 or something like it's that? It's between 40 and 45. It varies right. in width. Is it supposed to be 50? 50, 50 right of way. Yes. Okay. Uh, in the city standard. Now this is right. a county road. And, right. So, um, what is generally the practice when you have a road? What is the policy for a development like this of this size? What is the standard for the roadway? The standard There's, for the roadway. I'm thinking if, one of them is it has. Well, go ahead. You, you're the expert. Well, so. we would love to have 50 feet for the entire distance of this roadway. Uh -huh. However, the, um, we can't ask people that are currently de developed along the road to get additional right-of-way. So the best that we could do is right now for right-of-way is to request the applicant give us that. And so how does that work with the other? I mean, I'm just trying to understand how doing a right-of-way down the road way, how does that, how does that fix the issue? I mean, I'm, I'm genuinely asking I, you this. I understand. Without a traffic study, I don't know what the issue is. If the issue is do, we, do they need turning lanes, um, it, are there stacking requirements, until that traffic study is done, I don't know. There will be a requirement that any on-site would be approved as part of this, any on-site improvements would be approved as part of the subdivision. If there is an issue with concurrency, then it won't matter much about the road width unless additional lanes or turn lanes are added. Right. If the issue is at US-1, then again, that traffic study would have to say if there is turn lanes needed on US-1, either on or off US-1, then that would be required as part of the review for approval. Right, and, and what type of roadway is this considered? Even well, if, yeah, I know it's county, but what would you consider this? I, it's, the probably, road type? it's probably a local road, but it functions more as a collector. And the reason for that is because of the amount of traffic that comes in and out related to the park, as well as the fact that there is industrial this, at the so end this, of the street. All right, so this roadway is connected to the park where. Right, and here's why I'm asking that, because it, it appears to me with the development as a local, um, the park makes sense, but I don't know how much traffic um, rides that. But um, with the lot sizes that I see that, the units per acre on that roadway are very large. This, this is on the south side, is that correct? Yes, the south side of the parcel. But what I'm looking at is if it seems even with that, I, I don't know. I've, I've never taken JJ Road to that park, but um, I don't know what the traffic is on that. But it doesn't, I don't know, maybe they get a lot of uh, people from MIMS that take that route instead of the other route. But, but I have an issue with the road. And, and then I have an issue with their own policies that say, I thought, that you couldn't put this size of a development on a local road, but you correct me if I'm wrong. Well, we certainly would prefer not to, but we ha there's only so much that you can do with, you can only deal with the vacant property you've got. So Short of the county wanting to come in and take right of way mm -hmm. off of the existing other properties, there's not much else you can do. Here's the dilemma that I see as well. Currently, the county said, hey, we're going to approve 99 units. They were good with it. So then we came in in 2006. We said, okay, fine. 
we would like for you to annex. There's some benefits to you, benefits to us. We'll increase it to 112. That'll offset some costs is what I'm thinking. Um, but at what point does it tip? What point do we say, um, is it too much? Is it, because um, in my opinion, a 99 for, if it was a truly a local road would be too much. But that's just my opinion, but, um, but that's all I'm gonna ask for now. Well, let's see, um, two more, one more. So this is uh, averaged at two density units per acre. And then it's, you're saying it's compatible with the residence next to this, the parcels next to this. And so, and I believe those are county properties on the north side. They are. And are those like maybe, are those 10,000 square foot lots? Some of them half are. Half acre? Or? Some of them are half acre lots. Okay. What I said was that the land use is the same at two dwelling units an acre, but the okay. development is of in, somewhat larger lots in some of those areas, especially to the east, the south, and some to the yeah. north. Are so it's just that they were developed, well, they, they are a little bit larger than what they were. Than what the maximum okay. could be, yes, sir. So okay. if you looked at the future land use map, you'd say two units an acre. Right. If you look at what's on the ground, you will see that these lots are larger in some right. instances than half acre. Because yeah, my issue, I, under, I follow what you're saying, and because I was looking at the lot size that's being proposed is not the same as is next to it. But, okay, thank you. Mr. Sievers. Partly uh, to clarify uh, Mr. Richardson's question on uh, June 3rd, I sent an inquiry to staff saying, has wetland evaluation been performed? Locating the jurisdictional wetlands and any functional value assessment been performed on the subject land pursuant to policy 1.6.4 of the conservation element. If so, please provide that information. On uh, June 4th, uh, I received a response uh, from staff, I'm not aware of any environmental evaluation has been completed either at this time or at the previous approval by council. Subsequently, later in that day, uh, staff did say, provide uh, to me and the rest of you a copy of the Atlantic uh, report that was dated, I think, February 8th mm -hmm. uh, of this year and uh, indicating that they had just received it. Uh, the fundamental reason why I had asked that question is in accordance with the conservation element, if we're dealing with wetlands less than five acres, and I'm looking at policy 1.6.3 and strategy 1.6.3.2, if there's less than five acres, uh, development shall be subject to review to determine what protection in any should be received from the development. Said review shall be based upon the functional value criteria set forth in 1.6.4. Um, and isn't it a standard practice when somebody's submitting an application for less than five acre development that they're required pursuant to the comprehensive plan to submit this functional value determination? I have a, I th there's two issues here. One is what is the comprehensive plan designation? And the second is how is the property impacted by the um, development? And if you go to uh, one point further on in these policies, it talks about that this is done prior to the issuance of a development order for the actual 
determination. It is, in my opinion, very uncommon for someone who's not even sure that the property can be rezoned to have a functional value determination done. The, and so this property did what I believe is common for a delineation, but not the functional value because that's part of the permitting process. And it's very uncommon for someone to actually get a permit before the rezoning or the land use has been approved. Now, in the case of the Park Avenue, this did happen, but I believe that that was unusual because the project took a extraordinarily long time to get through the process. So I think that you saw that there, but I do not believe that that is a routine matter. So if I came to City Hall and asked to look at the files dealing with less than five acres uh, of wetlands, I will see prior to a permit being issued, a functional value determination being made. There would be one made during the permitting process at the water management district level. Yes, sir. Well, that's water management. The city has its own criteria in the comprehensive plan. I understand, plan. but we do not have the staff capable of determining that. So we're not following what the comprehensive plan says. That's what you're telling me. I'm telling you we do not have the staff to do that. So we depend on the water management district and people with that knowledge to do and that. My problem sitting up here, if I'm supposed to make a decision as to whether this land should be conservation or residential too, based upon its ability to be developed, I don't have the information to make that decision. Well, <laughs> the, cons the, element, the um, element requires that properties, wetlands which are greater than five acres should be kept in conservation. Sure. There is no wetland on this property which is greater than five acres. I understand that. I'm not talking about greater than five acres. I'm talking about what the comprehensive plan says for less than five acres. And if we're, we're being asked to make a decision to change conservation, on the future land map, he's mapped That's to something correct. else. And, and the reason that personally I think that this process is not a bad one is that I think that when you put a conservation easement on a wetland, you have added additional protection over the comprehensive plan. It only takes three votes at a um, in the case of a five-member council to change a future land use designation. In my experience, I have never seen a conservation easement given away. So I believe that a, the more permanent way to, con to protect a wetland is to put it in a conservation easement. Okay, I, I don't have any disagreement with what you're saying whatsoever and, there. And in yeah, fact- you, you sort of changed and in <laughs> subjects fact, on me. <laughs> and in fact, that's what the future land use element says, is that you can take a wetland out of conservation as long as you're using a master plan or PD process, which will then have a conservation well, that, that leads to a question I was going to ask later, but oh, good. now that you've brought it up, if uh, we decide to uh, proceed with, uh, with uh, changing the uh, comprehensive plan to residential two for the entire track, eliminating the conservation portion, can we attach as a condition of that approval that a conservation easement will be executed and signed on those wetlands. Because I've always been told we cannot attach conditions to comprehensive I believe plan. that's to be true. So I would not recommend that you change the conservation on those wetlands if you want to see them protected and you do not intend to have the master plan and a condition for the, because um, I think that you can well, condition the, the, a zoning, but you cannot condition a future land use. Well, the fallacy of all of that is that 
rezoning can be changed easily by uh, this applicant decide, I no longer want to do that. I apply for a rezoning application to something else and abandon the PD application, and then we have no protection whatsoever. Then my suggestion is to recommend denial. I'm trying to figure out a solution, <laughs> and you're telling me I cannot do that solution by attaching a condition, which the comprehensive plan contemplates. I, it is, I have been taught that conditional approvals of a future land use map doesn't work, that you have to do that at so, the rezoning master plan stage. As a commissioner, I have a problem then. It's what you're telling me. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Maybe we got in a little bit too deep uh, before we open this to the public. Um, all right. So let's open this to the public. And uh, can we have the applicant uh, come up? Uh, good evening. My name is Kim Rozenka. I'm with the law firm of Cantwell and Goldman in Coca Village. I'm here representing AG Ventures LLC. With me is Chad Genoni, the representative of the, the company, and um, who's previously been before you at least twice, might be more than that. Um, I can answer some of your questions. I hope, Mr. Severs, I have a lot of information to provide, and I know there are questions about this development. I know the residents have have questions. I've read the, the minutes of the PNZ and I've read the minutes of the City Council. I believe everyone is pretty familiar with the history of this property, but just because it has been a while since you've heard it, I'm gonna go through it again. Uh, this property was annexed by the City in 2006 at the height of the real estate market. It was purchased in 2004 by AG Ventures. They came into the City because they wanted City services, um, City water. The PUD zoning was placed upon this in 2006, and that was a new zoning category in 2006. The zoning in the county was to be SR, or suburban residential, which is two units to the acre on a res two. So it contemplated at least um, 144 units on this property. So that's nothing new. And it was on a local road. It was on a county road. Uh, that is a historical problem in the county. Properties are annexed, the, the streets are left with the county. Uh, not sh I'm not sure if they're fixing that, but it is, is, is a huge problem through the whole county. So as I said, this was annexed for city services. Um, the binding development plan is now void. I know there's been a lot of discussion about it, but it even says in the binding development plan, if it's annexed, this agreement is null and void. And again, what the county allows and what the city allows is quite different. So it really has no relevance other than the fact that it was residential to two units of the acre in Brevard County when it came in. Uh, 15 years after this property was purchased, the housing demand is back up. Is that right? Did I, did I add that right? Um, and um, AG Ventures wishes to develop this. There have been, to my knowledge, no new subdivisions in this area of Titusville in the last two decades. The last I could find was the Brandywine North Platte in 1991. So this is bringing new development into the city. Uh, most houses in this area have been there for a long time. Um, I'm not really sure this is rural. Uh, the federal government doesn't consider it rural because there are so many houses. There are pockets, but it is many houses in this area. Most of these houses are manufactured home. Many of them are smaller than what's being proposed here today. The cost to develop this property has gotten much higher than it was back in 2004. The value of the lots are not as great as they used to be. That's why the 112 units no longer works. And that's what the county approved was 112 units in the BDP. It wasn't 99. Um, regarding the county road, there was a traffic study submitted to your engineering department. I can't pronounce his name, but he goes by KB. So there is a traffic study with recommendations in your city. It just never made it to 
um, to planning and zoning for some reason. But I will tell you what the recommendations are in that report as I get to it. Uh, but it does say, the, engine, the traffic study, that there's no need to increase the size of the road. Regarding the zoning and future land use, as I said, um, the future land use in the county was originally two units the acre, and that's what's now being requested for the future land use. It was PD. There were comments made that that wasn't going to be appropriate, so it was changed to residential two by the applicant. The, the um, PD zoning, that was suggested by your staff. That's not what the applicant came in looking for. Uh, the staff likes the PD because of the open space, the amenities and things like that, and the flexibility. So that wasn't something that the applicant came in here looking for. And so they've done, again, what staff has asked it, and now they're being squished by some of the regulations. Also, um, the applicant does intend to protect the wetlands. As the staff report says, only one acre of the wetlands will be impacted, but no wetland greater than five, um, there's, there's no wetlands greater than five acres. Um, but that, that's when you get the conservation future land use. So it's when the wetlands are greater than five acres. The open space mandatory requirement is more than you would get in a regular subdivision. This could be zoned as a regular zoning category with a res two if you approve it. But this is what's been requested of staff. This is what staff likes. This is what the, the applicant has agreed to do. Originally, the applicant sought five units to the acre. As you may recall, it's now down to two units to the acre. The um, PD zoning category was amended in 2017, and there have been some changes that I think are important. Um, one, this PUDZ zoning that's on there now, if it were a PD, it would have expired because it's been longer than five years. However, right now, as your staff report says, if they wanted to go forward with this PUDZ, there's like many, many, many steps, more than a PD re require. So this is something that um, is beneficial and it somewhat streamlines the process. Section 33-1 explains that the PD is an alternative to a standard zoning district to provide efficient and economical land use. Section 33-5 says that the PD standards will protect the health, safety, and welfare of the general public. The applicant has to prove that, and I intend to do that tonight, to a greater extent than would have been possible under standard zoning requirements. Again, you have the open space. Um, you have the dedication of the 10-foot right-of-way by, um, by the applicant. And if you look at that property, his property goes almost all the way to, to US-1. So, in theory, that can be built out if necessary. Um, there's only a very small vacant parcel between the, the property and then to the east of US-1. Um, there's a greater setback from the north and the west of the adjacent properties, excuse me, north and east, that the applicant has agreed to. Again, under standard zoning, that would not be mandated or required. There's going to be a fire suppression system in each of the homes. Um, that's something that you would normally not get. And as Ms. Busaka said, this is going to improve the water system in the area by installing that loop. Regarding the environmental assessment, the staff knew about that, but they were never asked to provide it. So there's somewhat of a disconnect. The applicant doesn't know every provision of your comp plan. Staff should ask for things if necessary. When we learned that you needed it, we provided it. So that's, um, I don't mean to be, you know, to misspeak, but the applicant didn't know that was something that was required. But staff knew it had been done. I have a packet of information for you now that I'd like to review dealing with um, the surrounding land uses. So the first page of this packet shows the county future land use 
all around this property in, in future land use and zoning. And then in the green is the Titusville. Um, this property is kind of out on an island. It's, it's very awkward the, how this was done. I'm, I was really surprised when I saw um, the, the small adjacency to um, the city. So there, there's a variety of land uses, a variety of uh, future land uses, variety of zoning. This is just a mess. I mean, it's not consistent with general planning categories, but it's mostly residential. There is some industrial to the east and there's some commercial to the west, but this is residential. Um, and suggest that this residential zoning is compatible. The second page um, is from your planning and zoning February 6th agenda. I just wanted something colorful to show you so I could talk about it. And I've labeled it with some letters, which are residents. Uh, <clears throat> and you also see that there's residential lots to the north that are relatively small. And uh, I mean, a little over half an acre. And then across US-1, there are some smaller lots even more. And these are small houses, you can tell just by the picture. Um, the next page, well, if you look at immediately to the right of the red marking, you'll see an S. And um, that is to the east, and that's um, uh, the Scraggs home. And the Scraggs are very close to the property, which is why those properties adjacent to the Scraggs have been limited to one floor. And also, there's been some additional retention put behind those lots. Uh, <clears throat> the next property is um, Mr. Thiers, T-H-I-E-R, and he is down south of this property. And Mr. Thier has um, a house that's been there a long time. And he has a 1,300 square foot home. Mr. Thier has been concerned about traffic and flooding, which we will address. The next is the Franklins. They ha also have a, an older house in 1981. And again, these are 1,300 and 1,380 square feet, um, which is similar to what's going to be developed here. Uh, the Franklins are um, to the east of the property. The Franklins were concerned about access, drainage, compatibility, environmental impacts, and the BDP. Um, the quarters are the next in the packet. The quarters are to the south of the property. And the quarters have, have been there more recently. The quarters are concerned about density and buffers. And density and buffers have been added to this project. Um, there is, um, the Wilkinsons are next. They have an older house, a 1980 house. It's less than 1,200 square feet. Um, they are also to the east of the property. Um, I, I don't know what the concerns were, but I know that one of them spoke against the project at a PNZ meeting. Then you have the Stuckzinskis, and I apologize if I messed that up. Peter and Gail, they both spoke, and they are to the north of the property. Um, and this is another 1,300 square foot, square foot home. In the packet next is the Brady Grove Park subdivision, which is uh, the plat, which is in um, to the north of this property. And this is an older plat. I believe it's 1982. And these are the um, half acre, a little bit larger than some, a 0.58 acre and larger. Um, generally two units to the acre. And then I've provided some other houses. Um, there's an H that's uh, the Miss Huddleston. She's to the north. And that's an older house that's only 840 square feet. And then across US 1 to the west, is the Rivieras, and that's a 1958 house, um, which is uh, just about 940 square feet. So this is just to show you what's in the neighborhood, what's being proposed. The size is consistent with what's in the area and, um, and what, has, um, what some of the, the people speaking against it have discussed. Uh, Mr. Giannone, the applicant's representative, has met with the residents twice. He did meet with them in January, and he also met with them between the two PNZ meetings on February 27th. And he did listen to what was said, and there were changes made to the plan to address some of these concerns. Um, regarding the traffic, the traffic study was, con was submitted, was finalized in November of 2018 and was submitted to the engineering. The conclusions and recommendations 
are that uh, based upon the preceding traffic review, the road work network, roadway network in the vicinity of the site can accommodate the proposed site traffic without substantial degradation to the roadway network in the vicinity of the site. The analysis did not reveal any traffic concurrency violations. After investigation into potential peak hour warrants, it was further concluded that no traffic signal could be recommended at US Highway 1 and JJ Road or at US Highway 1 and Parish Road. And I will submit this to the clerk so it's in the record. And that was done by Motorist Designs of Merritt Island. So there will be no degradation to the road and the traffic can be handled on JJ Road. Um, regarding the concerns about flooding, that's a site plan issue. As everyone knows, they have to retain their own water and can't do damage to any other properties. Density, uh, Mr. Giannone changed the density from 162 units to 143 units, which actually that number was requested by Mr. Sievers, at, suggested at one of the PNZ meetings. Buffering is increased to the north and the, wet and the east where the residents that have expressed concerns reside. Decreased property values. Uh, Mr. Danoni has stated that these houses will be in the ballpark of $200,000 to $250,000. So these are not going to decrease property values. They are only going to increase property values. Uh, the chairman tonight expressed a concern about the road. Again, it is a county road. The city code has something in the PD ordinance that talks about PDs on local road. However, this city has already approved a PUDZ on a, on a local road. Uh, so it, it doesn't make any sense that you could have one without the other when they're very similar zoning classifications. Um, regarding the conservation comp plan and the environmental assessment, um, again, Mr. Sievers, the applicant was never told he needed it. They just can't know everything without staff helping to assist, but the staff knew about it. and. Um, and they also knew the wetlands had been evaluated by St. John's. They have been flagged and approved, and we can get that, and we'll get that before City Council. Uh, the other concern um, that has been raised is about the BDP. Again, that BDP is null and void. The applicant chose to come to the city for city services and actually improve you know, the city property values and, and tax base. So that BDP is no longer valid. As I mentioned, there have been changes since the transmittal hearing. Staff says there wasn't in their recommendations, but there were, there were changes. There were changes recently. Um, agreement to the 1,200 square feet. Uh, Mr. Giannone feels that he negotiated these changes with staff um, based upon what the citizens had suggested. Uh, the density will be at two units to the acres, increase the buffering, the one-story houses um, on the east side added drainage behind lots 104 and 107 and the minimum square footage 1,200 square feet. So we would request approval. This is a, a good plan development, a PD development. It allows the development of property that has no ability to develop right now because of the PUD procedure. And that is on page three of your staff report. I'm saying it doesn't have the ability to develop right now only because it hasn't gone through the Planning and Zoning Council and City Council for two additional rounds of public hearings with a separate conceptual master plan, a preliminary master plan, and a final master plan approval. So that'd be six more hearings. Uh, there is an increase in the road right of way for safety, and this will increase property values. So with that, I would ask that you approve CPA 1-2018 and the rezoning to uh, PD. Yeah. Yes, sir. Go ahead. The turn on your mic. The air, oh. the air, <clears throat> the, the, did you say the average value of these homes is like $250,000? He anticipates these houses will sell in this development for $200,000 to $250,000. $200,000 to $250,000? Okay. That's not what the neighboring houses are being sold for. As you see, the property values, the market values are substantially less, although they do have to save their homes protections because they've owned them so long. I haven't looked at the sale values. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a question for Bert? Okay. Obviously, uh, you're aware of 35-5, uh, for N2, 
of the code, which provides a plan development shall be so located with respect to arterial streets, collector streets, and other transportation facilities as to provide direct access to such PD without creating or generating traffic along local streets and residential areas. That doesn't seem very gray to me. <laughs> well, um, the city I, I know uh, I've heard you say that, um, well, that's what uh, the same regulation was under the PUDZ. I haven't seen that, but I accept what you're saying is correct. But uh, I don't understand the rationale that if if a mistake was made once, <laughs> that that means you're supposed to make the same mistake again? Is, I'm, I'm not sure that's... That's what your staff advised. That's all we can tell you. That's what the staff advised the applicant, that that's what it's done in the past. And also, there's no designation. This isn't a city road. So... Well, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with county roads. I would be surprised. This, this road might, in part, function as a collector, but I assume... I could be wrong that uh, it is designated as a local street under county classifications as well. And there's just a clear prohibition without generating, creating or generating traffic along a local street. Well, I would I mean, suggest that I'm not the one that's raised this in the past. Uh, Mrs. Franklin to raise that. The chairman has raised this. And so I want your perspective on it. My perspective is this is ambiguous and that it has to inert to the benefit of the applicant and that your, your expert has testified at service as, as a collector road. So I would say that there is evidence that we meet that criteria. Okay, I thank you for your <laughs> response to my question. All right, any other questions? All right, and obviously um, we'll let you come back at Great. the end. Unless you'd like Mr. Ginobili to come up. But I'm sure he's paying you, so I'm sure he'd prefer you to come up. So, All right. Um, Mr. Ginobili, were you uh, wanting to come up? Did, did uh, Good evening, Council Members. Chad Ginobili with AG Ventures. And uh, to answer your question, Mr. Stevers, on the wetlands, I might be able to clear that up a little bit as far as what our plan was on the impacts and the preservation of wetlands, if you'd like me to. Certainly. I, I realize, uh, and congratulations to you, you're really preserving most of uh, the wetlands. Uh, there appears from the information I've seen, there's 12 different Correct. wetland sites on this property, which seems like a, a lot to me. And uh, you're uh, really preserving most all of those and only impacting uh, one. And uh, the, I know the uh, Atlantic study reflected that if for every one acre that uh, you impacted, it might cost you $100,000 for impacting wetlands, is what the study said. Um, correct. In the so instance, how, how, how are you offsetting the impact that you are going to have to that acre of wetlands? So I think the question was, are, were they functionally significant wetlands? And we're actually impacting five very small wetlands. And St. John says if they're under a half acre, they don't consider them significant. Therefore, you can impact them without any mitigation or anything. So essentially, that's what we're doing. We're impacting five very small wetlands, well under a half acre and there will be no mitigation. The larger ones, the ones that had significance, we're preserving. All right, so I, I wanted, was that it? Yeah. I wanted to bring up, since uh, you bought this in 2004. Yes. And originally you had it zoned at 99 with the county. It's either 99 or 110 or so some, somewhere in that range. I know there was a discrepancy. We keep seeing 99, and so right. I was taking it as that was a cap maybe you had the ability. I'm trying to get the history on this to understand if there was caps previously put on this from the county. Part of, part of it was market conditions. Lots that were the size at that point in time were selling for a premium. Mm -hmm. 
that's not the case as you know the market conditions changed. So that's essentially where we came up with our layout, our lot layout. What was so? What was the count for 2004? For the count that you originally had, this uh, 112. It looks like it was 112 lots. All right. So when you came into the city, you brought that in at 112. 112 or so some, you're somewhere saying in that you brought range. it in the same. I'm sorry. Yeah, it was exactly roughly exactly the same. Just uh, within, crossover. give or take a few, give or take a few lots. I think is what it was. Um, is it possible for staff to? There's. It's kind of important to me uh, the, because I I was pretty sure I heard this back in 2006. Yeah. And I could have swore that it was being brought in at a higher level, and a higher level than the county. Yes. Yeah, I think. It, Let's say it was maybe for a couple of lots, or but I mean, I, it wasn't minimal. the I'm not, yeah, it wasn't the intent. What I'm trying to get at is, uh, it's not that I have an issue with it coming up. I kind of looked at it as maybe an offset for the additional cost that you're. I mean, it is going to be expensive to for the lines, for the stations, for the right. so not a big deal. But what I'm trying to ascertain is, was there caps? And if there was, so we had a cap in 2004, we had a cap oh. in 2012. In 2012, or not 12, six. Yeah. And then what I'm trying to say is, so what are we looking at now? And so in the starting negotiation, yeah, hey, you always want to start high and work your well, way down. But well, just to tell you, when we were originally coming into this plan before, you know, we started talking with staff, we had a lot more units planned for this, mm -hmm. and then through the PD process, which was recommended by staff because they believe that's a good plan. We had actually, there was a lot of conditions that they put upon us, and we ultimately came down to 162, mm -hmm. which was feasible. And this is, you know, within the last year here. So there was a lot, a lot of negotiation, or a lot of constraints put on this site with regard to open space and various other things. And we came to 162. We felt that was a number we could live with. We come in, and, and nobody saw that, you know, that process, but it was, it was lengthy. It took several months, and um, we did. We came here, we thought 162 was good, and through this process, we've had to reduce it, you know, and we've, we've agreed to come to the 143. Right. And so it's, from, I'm one person, but from my standpoint is trying to find the balance between what is your neighbors and what is possible. I'm going to give you the binding development plan for the record so you can see that it was 112. And this is this is in this 2006. This oh, this is. 2005 in the county. Okay. That's, that's you know, for the record. So, because what your records only had one page of that, we searched mm -hmm. it and got the entire document. Because Good. there were two of them. One was earlier because it didn't include all the property, but that's the latest from the county. Okay. And I apologize, it's got my scratch on it, but. I mean, I. The, do you want this? Do you need yeah. to? Okay. Do I need to give it to you? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so it's it's the issue of we know that you can come in at a minimum of 112. The minimum, right? That's what you already have. Okay. And now it's uh, moreover of because everything's been approved for that. You have the zoning, and I understand that. It's now it's what is reasonable for in my opinion, what can we do? Can we go any higher? Can we, can we, do we say that this is acceptable? Um, and then the last one, that was, with the last meeting, that was what was said, was that the zoning was correct, but here it is back, it went to council, we denied it, they approved it, it went to the state, came back, and so now it's, it's all back for right. to it, us. But. My recollection when we were here, it, it, there was a recommendation by one of the board members, R2, and I think supported caps. by another. At, at you know, and now this didn't get approved as a motion, but there was it was you know it was brought up that that the two units per acre would be acceptable. No question that um, I, I mean, my impression you have you've really worked at negotiating um, the trying to make people happy. You've done the buffers. Right. You've done. Uh, the reductions you've done, I, I understand that. I okay. appreciate that. Okay. So Thank it's you. it's don't take it like I'm not feeling that way. Okay. Um, but it's still coming to 
consensus as a, a board, so. Okay. Um, all right, are there any other questions? All right, thank you. Thank you. Can we have the, is that was it for the, that side? Okay, I'm assuming. The, all right, so can we have the first card? David Bato. Thank you, because it's getting close to my bedtime. <laughs> my name's David Bato. I'm from Indian Harbor Beach, and I serve as a volunteer on the board of the Marine Resources Council. I'm here to speak for the Indian River Lagoon tonight. Um, we have this Save the Lagoon program, 10 years, hundreds of millions of- Pardon me, sir, this is, no, I wanted to make sure, are you talking on this item? It's specifically regarding this? Yes. Okay, I just want to make Absolutely. sure that- Absolutely. That you weren't gonna um, want to speak at a different part of the agenda. All right, thank you, sorry. Please continue. We have this in Save the Lagoon program, hundreds of millions, 10 years, and every time you talk about it or see an article on it, it always says what we're trying to do is clean up the results of 50 years of neglect. There are several factors in that word neglect, but the primary one, the root cause, is 50 years of decisions of land use and development done without regard to their impact on the lagoon. And that has to change. We cannot do business as usual, no more. Because that's what got us here to where we are today in the lagoon. And it's still going on. We've seen it here tonight. Uh, this is my third session on density change in less than a month. Not a single time, including this one, has there been a mention of lagoon impact on this change of density. And there will be impact. There will be runoff. There is a considerable impervious footprint that will cause nutrients, chemicals, herbicides, pesticides, and yes, water, water carried sediment into the lagoon. The very things that we're working to correct now. To add to that problem, excuse me, to add to the problem while we're trying to correct from the past is just not good management. We cannot afford to do it again. We have voted three times in this county to tax ourselves to protect and preserve our native habitat, twice with the Eels program and now with the Save the Lagoon program a full 1%. That's a strong statement. And all of those votes were not marginal, they were strong. That the lagoon, which is our most important habitat and our most endangered habitat, is a high priority for us, a very high priority. We trust that you honor that priority and in fact, we hope you share it because you live on the lagoon too. If we're going to accomplish this, we've got to change this kind of business, which affects the long-term health. We're dealing with short-term on the lagoon plan. This is the future of the lagoon, these kinds of decisions. This zoning, we, we believe that this zoning, the current zoning is not really desirable for this land. It is close to the lagoon. It's in the lagoon drainage basin. It is four tenths of a mile from the east edge to the lagoon proper. There is a conservation segment just east of this property on the lagoon that is part of the Florida Forever uh, Indian River Lagoon Blue Wave project. They have acquired that. In incidentally, our EELS program is also a partner in that Indian River Lagoon Blue Wave project. It comes down the entire west side of the lagoon and is meant to provide a permanent conservation buffer and protect the lagoon. This is, I think, 1,300 feet from the edge of that. These many small wetlands you see gives you an idea of the character of this land. It's gonna take a lot of fill to do this job. We believe that even though these are small, the total is considerable. And believe me, 
one of the things we cannot lose are wetlands. In fact, in our comprehensive plans, 1993, it states no net loss of wetlands since 1993. In other places that have had this problem, they've gone even further. Sar Sarasota County, for their Sarasota Bay says, we will add two acres of wetland every year. We're just saying we won't lose anymore. If you mitigate this wetland idea, uh, and he's, I'm saying this dogma will, will do away with one acre. We can't afford to lose an acre, even if it's scattered. We need every bit of pervious surface we can get. Please, please consider that. We have worked hard and long to get this program started to try and save this lagoon. Our objective is not to just save the lagoon. Our objective is to bring back our fishery. That's the habitat we're talking about. Right now, we don't have one. We would like to get it back. I respectfully urge you to deny this change. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Other questions? No? Okay, next card, please. Terry Franklin. Good evening. Terry Franklin, JJ Road, Titusville, Florida. First, I want to uh, acknowledge and thank this commission and the city for recognizing the incompatibilities of this project with the MIMS community and for pushing for the residential two land use. Um, it was definitely a positive move. However, we still have some incompatibility issues regarding the proposed zoning that needs to be addressed that will make this project in line with the community that we um, know. I'll try not to be repetitive with the previous comments from the prior meetings, um, but I just want to highlight some of the key issues that still exist for the community. Um, and as you know, at the previous meetings, the commission acknowledged some of those incompatibilities and voiced their concerns on the previous annexation. We do understand that the city can't go back and undo what was done but you can work towards right-sizing it now to create a harmonious, compatible project for the area. So I want to remind the commission that the proposed development is not what was agreed to by the developer with the community regarding the number of units, the buffers, and the conversation, conservation easements. Uh, yes, that prior development agreement uh, did become void with the county. However, that was not uh, the entire agreement that the developer also agreed before this commission and before city council and with the community that if they were annexed, they would live up to that development agreement. And that was part of their annexation uh, approval. So um, the prior agreement was for 112 units, which included 80 foot buffer, buffers from the adjoining properties of that 80 foot buffer, there was a 36 foot conservation easement with no, improvement, no improvements in that easement. We see that the developer has shown a 70 foot buffer on the master plan and the staff report lists that as an approval criterion. But if you really look closely, you'll notice that 50 feet of that buffer is inclusive of the lots, leaving really only a 20 foot buffer that is proposed to have the stormwater improvements in it. The community also uh, spoke to the developer about a wall along the boundary lines in addition to the buffer to address this concern, but did not get any feedback from the developer on that request. The major issue surrounding this development is the proposed zoning and environmental impacts it will create. Although the land use uh, under the art residential two, the developer is still seeking a PD zoning classification. The community feels that a PD zoning is not compatible with the rural area and would further urbanize the MIMS community. I think we have all agreed that the area is rural and the community feels the amenities proposed or required by a PD zoning classification does not fit um, the rural setting. Okay, can I have additional time? Um, I guess how would the commission like to, uh, is there a motion to extend? And how much time would you need? Two minutes. Two minutes. So moved. Two minutes. Second. 
Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, where did I leave off? Uh, the staff report touches on this but explains or justifies the PD request on JJ by pointing out that JJ has direct access to US-1, which, which we are confused by this. At some point, doesn't most local streets intersect or connect with higher classified roads? Let's say this development was located somewhere else in an existing neighborhood, like along Indian River Avenue or Hunter's Ridge, where larger homes and larger estate-like lots exist. But because those neighborhoods connect to or intersect with collector or highway, uh, we would allow a PD cluster with much denser uses and smaller homes in the middle of an existing subdivision. That doesn't sound acceptable in those cases, and it shouldn't here. The commission should think about what precedence approving a PD zoning here and overlooking the code means for future areas of the city and other neighborhoods or local roadways. To cl um, in closing, the community feels based upon all the facts, a more compatible and allowed zoning by city code would be a rural residential. This is supported by the fact that the majority of the par parcels on JJ are one acre, but with a few half acre lots. And another parcel, which was recently annexed on JJ, was assigned the RR classification. Therefore, there must have been some acknowledgement by city staff that the area was a rural setting when the parcel was annexed. If you look at all the properties on JJ, they are all zoned with a designation that includes the word rural at the county level, and this is not by accident. Um, just to read an excerpt from the um, develop what was agreed by the developer with the community, uh, it includes a landscape buffer on the north property line, shall be a minimum of 90 feet and 80 feet on the east. The landscape buffer includes a 36 foot conservation buffer easement on the lots adjoining the north and the east property line. For lots containing the 36 conversation easement, structures shall neither be permitted within the 36 cons converse conservation easement nor within 20 feet of the conservation easement. I appreciate your time and um, your and your consideration and the facts presented as you move forward with your recommendation for the project. Okay, thank you. Are there questions, Ms. Sprinkle? All right, thank you. May I I'm defer to you. What do you suggest? I'm, I'm not accustomed to cross-examining. The proper term. But no, but I mean, I'm, I'm, we generally have guaranteed a rebuttal, not a cross-examination. Re rebuttal would come at the end of the right. public comment, and if there's a specific question that the applicant would like to have the commission ask of a prior speaker, then that would be the appropriate time for it. At the end? During the rebuttal. What happened During the, the rebuttal, leaves? at the end. Right? At, it comes at the end of the public comment. Right, so I would. So you're denying me my right to And that's why I'm deferring. I'm saying this is not standard. I'm setting the record. That's all I'm doing. All right. I thought we couldn't stand up and just yell out loud that's approved. All right. Let's try to uh, have a little decorum. I, I think I've been as I'm trying to let everybody speak. I'm trying to give everybody their uh, side. Please respect the commission. Um, next card, please. John Thayer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello again. My name is John Thayer. I live on JJ Road. Um, now, staff has said that we're rule two two homes you know on our lots well back in 88 when i bought my property we weren't allowed two homes on our property we we're allowed only one home so that's changed over the years so that's you know bull in my in my case here but um now they say they had a traffic study done when was this traffic study done? 
four o'clock in the afternoon during the middle of the week. Why not have it done from five o'clock till seven o'clock at night when everybody goes to Chain Lakes Park for all the soccer games, softball games and all that because JJ is just loaded with vehicles coming in and out and they come in the north end a lot. And being a county road, you're, you're stating that 50 foot for a city road and they're gonna give 10 foot on the north side. Well, four foot off the road, there's telephone poles. So what's that gaining JJ Road? It's not. And on the south side of the road, a foot off the road is a ditch. So it's still a county road. It doesn't meet the city criteria. So I'm against this whole thing. Um, back in when they first went to the county, I've read 99 homes. They're saying 112. I don't see that paper, but um, in 2006, when the city annexed it, it was 112. And I think that's what it should be limited to, you know. So <clears throat> as far as wildlife, there's panthers out there. Well, I've seen panthers. Uh, a lady down around the backside, she's got a picture of this black cat and it's big. It's not, you know, bobcat or nothing like that, but it still lives in that area. I've had turkeys, I've had geese, I've had hogs. So if they put this development in, there goes the wildlife that's been in our area forever. So, and then again, all this dirt they're gonna bring in, where's the water gonna go? It's gonna go out to the lagoon, just like the man had said, because that's where it flows to. It goes down, crosses railroad tracks, and goes right out in our lagoon. And what doesn't, it backs up into our property on the south side, the park. So I don't know where they're gonna put all this water to. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Randy Scrag. Good evening, everyone. Randy Scrag, 2160 East JJ Road. And uh, this project did start out in the county, and I went to all the meetings, and we drew, we did agree on the uh, the binding agreement up to 112 homes. Me and the developer uh, shook hands at 107. That's where your 107 comes in. And then it was annexed into the city. Now, when it got annexed into the city, we came to a meeting and they spoke for it. And then when we got up and spoke against it, we told them this has already been approved in the county. And they were startled. They said, it has, they asked the developer, and he said, yes. Did you agree to this many homes and these easements? He said, yes. So the city council voted, everyone voted. They said, if you agreed to this in the county, then you're gonna to agree to this in the city, but you're gonna put two entrances and two exits. And a developer agreed. So it's already went in front of the council and I don't know exact date, 2005, 2006. And that's where we, we left it at. And then we come back uh, 13, 14 years later, boom, 162 homes. So I went through it all, followed it closely. So if you have any questions, please, I'd like to answer them. And I've seen a panther on this property twice. My wife's seen it one time. And the deputy sheriff said there's been a panther killed on JJ Road. I didn't see that. I just seen these ones live, and uh, people working at the park have also seen this. So, um, not to repeat about water and the road and all that right there. I'll entertain any questions if you have any, please. 
All right. Um, is that it? That's it. All right. Yeah. Chair Williams. Yes. Um, I need to correct something that I said prior before you called the next speaker. Okay. I had to refer to resolution number 24-1997 under public comment 5.10 public comment the procedure states that you shall open the floor to public comment taking speakers in order they signed up and allow cross-examination of witnesses by the applicant and staff representative i apologize but and i stand to correct myself that the prior speaker shall be cross-examined by the applicant okay all right um i see no questions thank you all right, Mrs. Franklin, would you um, mind coming back up? All right, thank you. And thank you for doing this. Sure. And, and it's just a clarification, but cross-examine is the only word I know to use. Uh, Ms. Franklin, you were reading from a document regarding landscaping. What were you reading from? This is the recorded document that's in the public records. Is that the binding development plan between the owner and the county? Correct. Okay. That's all. Thank all right, you. I understand. I think I said that. Okay. All right, next card, please. Bill Klein. I'm Bill Klein, live in uh, Titusville, uh, 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 3 Indian River Avenue. I have also volunteer to work at uh, Chain of Lake Parks, and there is very heavy usage of Chain of Lakes Park uh, for soccer games and baseball games. There is a lot of traffic when the people are arriving and leaving the game. The major part, one of the major parking areas is just south of JJ Road across from where this development is. So I think you'll have to consider the amount of traffic that occurs for the park. The second thing that I'm more concerned about is the environmental aspect of the area. In Chain of Lake Parks, I have observed uh, limpkins, wood storks, roseate spoonbills, and many other shorebirds. It's quite it's just across the street from where you're discussing. There are also a lot of alligators that I've not seen in the park across the street. I have not walked the property that you're discussing, but looking at aerial photographs, I'm not exactly sure that all these wetlands are isolated from each other. When you look at the density of trees, there seems to be some sort of a water passage, maybe they're little streams, maybe they're just little wet depressions. So when there's a lot of rain, that I think there's some connection between these wetlands. Particularly when I look at the trees and I see certain like passageways where the trees are much more dense than the rest of the property. So I think these wetlands should be kind of considered more as an integrated group. I think. Another thing that with wildlife in the area, wildlife generally needs passages to go through a piece of property. What I see being done on this property is they're making little isolated areas, like here's a section where one pond is, here's another section, and there's no interconnection. So this is gonna severely disrupt the wildlife that's in the area. Another thing I was looking at is most of the development I've seen in Titusville clear cuts the land and wipes out all the trees. Now I'm assuming that you might get 10 mature trees on an acre. When I was look, hearing that, oh, well, there's gonna be 143 lots, which means two uh, houses per acre, that's about 70 acres. Uh, Ten, if I assume 10 trees to an acre, I calculated that 10 you know, mature trees. That's like 290,000 gallons of stormwater per year. So if there's about 70 acres involved, that's like 21 million gallons of stormwater that's gonna be running into the Indian River Lagoon. Uh, now I don't know, that's just in what the trees are doing. 
What I also know is when you put in all the roads, sidewalks, roofs, driveways, there's probably gonna be a lot more than 21 million gallons of stormwater going into the Indian River Lagoon, which will be polluting it. And like the first speaker was commenting, we have done a lot to try to clean up the Indian River Lagoon. We're spending a tremendous amount of money and I'm one of the volunteers who's going out monitoring water quality once a week to try to determine what's going on in the Indian River Lagoon. So I think environmentally, we've got to look at the amount of stormwater that's gonna actually be produced with this type of development. We've got to try to keep the trees. I do not like seeing land clear cut with trees. Like one of the things I know, if you have a nicely treed area, it reduces the air temperature in the area by about 10 degrees over clear cut areas and sidewalks. Now, if you're looking at the temperature of the surfaces, it reduces the surface temperature by 30 to 45 degrees. I have actually taken a thermometer and been gone out into the street, measured the temperature there, you know, like about 112 degrees, I go into a shaded area and you measure the temperature on the ground and it's more like maybe about 90 or 80 degrees. So there's gonna be a lot more heat produced when the trees are lost. There's gonna be a lot of stormwater that's gonna be produced and there's gonna be a lot more pollution going into the Indian River Lagoon. Right. Thank you very much for your consideration. Mary Spar. Good evening, members of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm Mary Spar. I live in Coco, and tonight I'm speaking for Sierra Club Turtle Coast Group. Um, Sierra Club uh, became interested in Titusville again recently because of the clear cutting and tree preservation issue. And then we started to look at some of the development that was proposed. For this particular development, we're concerned about the buffers in open space. At the March 6th P&Z meeting, the applicant stated, quote, we don't know if we're gonna have to clear the whole site or if we can leave some natural vegetation. And, or if we can leave some natural vegetation, you would think that the applicant knows what he's gonna do after all the earlier studies he did for the St. Johns River Water Management District, which are available to the public and the information is voluminous. Uh, it's available online. And in these studies, he um, studied the grading. So you would think he would know what he's going to do about the natural vegetation. Titusville Code provides a way of getting out of saving large trees. Plus, there's no requirement that a development preserve tree canopy. All a developer has to do, according to sections 30-324 landscaping, is provide an area of at least 10% low and moderate water tolerant vegetation. The buffers and open space in this proposed development sure would look a lot nicer if the applicant was willing to preserve large trees and plant significant tree canopy there. The surrounding properties have a lot of lovely trees. I believe the applicant would have an easier time preserving large trees and providing canopy if he were limited to 112 homes. To me, the open space provided in the 143 home concept doesn't do much to provide opportunities for active and passive recreation. 
It seems the applicant has located a loophole in the PD open space requirements in section 30-163 F3. To count the wetlands and stormwater retention and detention areas as open space, all he has to do is put in, I'm sorry. How much more time do you think you need? May I please have three minutes? I'll move, we give her three minutes. Okay, is there a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All right. Okay, so to count the, let me, since I was interrupting the middle of the sentence, to count the wetlands and stormwater retention and detention areas as open space, all he has to do is put in some fountains, benches, and walkways. The applicant could have offered really significant recreational opportunities in the open space, and I think he would have an easier time doing this with only 112 units. Besides the buffers in open space, Sierra Club is concerned with the wetlands, which are hydrologically connected to our precious Indian River Lagoon. Even though most wetlands will be not impacted, these wetlands will suffer degradation due to fertilizers and pesticides more commonly used in developments with homeowners associations, like the Brooks Landing Homeowners Association planned in 2007 that would have required sodding the entire outside area except landscape parts with Floratam St. Augustine bitter blue grass, installing sprinkler systems, and spending $3,000 on initial landscaping, not counting sod and sprinklers. That information from St. John's file. Plus, runoff would be a problem with 65% impervious surface allowed for each lot. 65% impervious surface allowed for each lot. Any excess from the stormwater pond to the northeast will eventually reach the lagoon. It is interesting that the plans for the 112 acres, 112 homes did not seem to warrant this stormwater pond in the Northeast, likely because of less impervious surface. Um, I do have a question. I do not understand the appendage in the Northeast cul-de-sac, which looks like a water spigot. Now other stormwater will drain to this change of lake, adding to the important water filtering tasks those lakes now perform. Even though the St. John's paperwork acknowledges that the chain of lakes is not designed to handle pollutants from new development. In short, the 143 home development will negatively impact the Indian River Lagoon at a time when the lagoon's health is precarious, very precarious, and I believe those 143 homes will negatively impact the lagoon more than 112 homes. In conclusion, Sierra Club asks you to deny this comp plan zoning combination. The 112 homes is more than enough. And I'd like to pass out the um, two village concept with 112 homes. Thank you. I actually had a question for you, so I wanted to, um, and, and so this is in reference to some of the other things that got brought up. My understanding is that this was a, an old orange grove. So I'm sorry? I, my understanding is this was an old orange grove? Um, yes, right. St. John's uh, file did indicate that. All right, so. Part, uh, not but that not all of it was in no, the No, I understand, and, and I understand that around the wetlands areas, there's some big trees and that. Um, so as I've had a couple speakers come up and I'm looking at the maps and I'm going back and forth and, and I'm like, 
So in those areas, um, really they're not touching that area because it's gonna be conservation. And so what I'm trying to, I guess, bring up is that these are old orange groves. So when I think of clear cutting, I mean, obviously you want trees, but I mean, let's face it, these are orange groves. Um, and I appreciate even, I mean, I grew up from, actually from Cocoa as well when I was younger. They had orange trees in our back and it's great, but I don't know if I consider that a forest or, or uh, you know, I'm thinking of when they tear down orange groves to build homes. Correct. Um, I, I see what you're saying and, and what um, I've tried to do is um, I went into the St. John's file and looked at the natural communities that were described um, in the request for additional information in the responses. And you really have some valuable um, communities. Um, some are located, uh, in fact, a lot were located in the, uh, the um, wetland hard, hardwood forests, um, yes. which, which are the two large wetlands. And um, there's, you know, uh, um, information in here. I'm not... Um, totally up to speed since I've just been trying to, to um, find out as much as possible in a short amount of time. But um, I really <coughs> would like, um, you know, some further guarantee that, that um, you know, for example, in the eastern portion, we have the wetland hard, hardwood forest, um, a couple areas of that. And then um, you have um, excuse me. Okay, temperate center. hardwood, and you know, I'm not sure exactly what's going on, especially with that little appendage coming out of the cul-de-sac. I mean, I've kind of heard it might be a pump, which would be horrible for, I mean, you would think for, you know, the drainage in the lagoon. I mean, it's just that there are opportunities and they need to be studied. And that's what we're asking for, um, to do the best that we can. And I, I feel like it'd be easier to do something better if you ha had less impervious surface and less constraints with regard to the number of homes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Can we have the next card, please? Michael Myjack. Mr. Myjack. Yes, sir. Are you still on the Environmental Commission? I'm chair now, sir. Oh. Congratulations. I was going to talk with you about we're supposed to have a common member. Yes, we are. There, this is uh, Michael Myjack, uh, Titusville, Florida. We're supposed to have a member, uh, an environmental member, on the planning and zoning. And all I've been hearing is environmental issues popping up. And it seems like it would be helpful if we could work together and get well, that We have fixed. new members, and maybe yeah. the new members might want to chair or not. We have an opening, so <laughs> if anybody's interested. Um, I. Uh, I, I've uh, had my eyes opened over the last few years because uh, having been a, uh, a member of the TEC, we have constantly talked about reforesting Titusville, restructuring, rebuilding our urban forest. We became Tree City USA, we give away trees. We're trying to develop and expand that program. And, uh, and then we have the other hand where we just wipe everything clear except for 10% of scrub in the far back corners that nobody wants, and we call that a done deal. We, uh, our code is severely lacking in this regard. We don't do anything to preserve tree canopy. And uh, yes, it was an orange grove 70 years ago, but if you drive through the property, you will see some rather large and majestic trees on that land. And we don't do anything to save that. We don't require that the trees be saved. We would like to see a certain amount. 
but everything that we do right now in our code does not mandate that to happen. Um, Member Seavers, you mentioned something earlier with regards to our ability to follow our own comprehensive plan, and I kind of agree with you. This is where I see we're at fault. We're not, either we don't have the documents that we need when we need them to make the decisions that we need to make for the right reasons. Our comp plan was put together as a plan, but if that comp plan has to change every single time a developer wants to come in and do something, that's no plan. That's useless, really. So my counsel to you, as we've heard about the Indian River Lagoon, uh, from my own experience, I can tell you we need to save the lagoon as much as we can. Everything that we do, every our building practices, are what put this lagoon in peril. We need to change those. And I hope you'll work with us to make that happen. And in this case, I think the 112 that the developer had previously agreed to should be maintained. I don't see a reason for us to give additional density without gaining anything back. The citizens of this community have been talking about trees and tree preservation and doing what we can to change our development practices. But what it boils down to is the, the social capital the value of those trees, the things that they provide to all of us, are being squandered in lieu of a few more development homes. And I think we can do a better job with that, and I would encourage you to, uh, to consider those facts. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions of Mr. Majek? All right. Thank you. Next card, please. Kathleen Burson. Good evening, Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, it sounds to me like the agreement was 112 lots, and, um, and since they're here asking for more, let's give them 113. Um, that way, we will, we will get back 35 lots, and, you know, that would be... I'm, I'm looking at compatibility and the environment. You know, we're looking at compatibility with the adjacent residents. Um, they're not going to get neighbors here that are on half-acre lots or one-acre lots like they are. They're going to—they're getting. This project is proposing seven lots per acre. That's incredibly dense. So if we—but the agreement was 112. So, you know, we can't—you know—you can't go back on an agreement. Um, unless there's some qualifying reason. But I think that that taking back the, I mean, gaining back the 35 lots for the environment, that's five additional acres that could save some large trees that have, haven't been accounted for here. I don't see a tree survey. Um, typically your large trees are in the uplands, not in the wetlands. Um, your wetlands and your uplands are codependent upon each other. There's an interdict. I shouldn't say codependent, and that's not really a positive word, but um, there's an interdependence between ecosystems. So gaining 35 lots back for the environment and for the compatibility to the neighbors would um, go a long way to um, identify some large trees, require less stormwater retention ponds, ease up the, the, the density of this, the congestion of all these homes stacked together, they're only 50 feet wide. I mean, that's, that's substandard to me, you know, um, especially with this many lots. So I, I just think it would benefit the development and the neighbors and the environment to um, ease this back a little bit by 35 lots and go back to the original agreement of 112 or 113 if they want to get this approved. So thank you. Thank you. Are the questions of Mrs. Burson? Thank you. Uh, next card. This is the last card. Jenny Scrag. Hello, Planning and Zoning. My name is Jenny Scrag. I live at 2160 East JJ Road. And first off, I'd like to start out with um, 
my buffer. I mean, you all might remember me about my buffer. I was promised an 80-foot buffer by the developer back in 2006 when they said about the 112 homes. Well, if you look at their plan, if you look close at it, it's really an only 20-foot buffer. And the other 50-foot is to the person's home. That's where they're getting 70 foot. That doesn't, that's not even anywhere near my 80 foot. I'm still only getting 20 foot if you'll look at their master plan. I meant to bring copies, but I left them in my truck. But if you'd look at it, I've got it right here on this master plan. If you we, guys we are bringing one. it, do you we, have it? We're good. Okay, if you can look at that, that's not my 80 foot. It's only still my 20 foot. It's 50 foot to that home, which is, I, that's not what I was promised by the developer. And, the, okay, back to the road again. He's gonna promise to give some feet, so like five foot of the road to the city. How is he gonna add five foot to the road where it's only 45 foot? I don't understand how they're gonna, uh, which it, does, it doesn't meet the city requirements, but they're gonna add 10 foot to the road? I don't understand how he's gonna do that. That's what it mentions in the staff report. And for 143 homes, that's going to generate, per the staff report, 13, let's see, 1,300 trips per day, where the, the 112 units will only do 1,072. That's on the staff report for the traffic um, survey. And for the rural residential requirement, only 30 foot front and rear and 15 foot size, which which I believe is reasonable considering the surrounding parcels that we already have, which are acre and acre half and two acre lots. And I just think the 112 homes, that's what we agreed with. We should be able to, that's what we all agreed to. And that's what I would like to keep it as. If y'all would please consider that and consider my buffer that I was promised that didn't get it after they said they gave it to me and did not. So I please would like you to look at that. That's all I have, if anybody has any questions. Any questions? No, thank you. Thank you. All right, Ms. Verzenka, you'd like to come up and do a rebuttal. Thank you, Chairman. I should be brief. Again, I would just like to, again, Kim Rozenka representing uh, the applicant. Um, there's a lot of reference to the agreement with the developer. That was actually an agreement with the county and the developer. Um, the county regulations are different than the city regulations. People come to the city because of different regulations and again, because of the city water. So they came to get city sewer. sewer. Uh, they were annexed in. Uh, most of the people speaking to you are not in the city. They don't have to comply with your ordinances or your comp plan. Uh, the, there seems to be some concern that a PD zoning is bad. And the PD zoning just allows the flexibility. It requires open space. If you grant the res two, but don't grant the PD, they can come back in with the same number of units without the open space. Um, and again, that comp plan amendment that says it can't be on a local road really doesn't make any sense when you can have a subdivision on a local road. So um, it seems to be a, an oddity um, in the ordinance, not the comp plan. So the, the, the benefits of a PD, again, which the staff asked the applicant to do is that you have uh, required open space that regular zoning does not do. There, there is no agreement with the community. That was an agreement with the, the, the county. Um, what you were given this old layout with village one and village two, this is the exact, the calculations of the buffer next to the scrags is exactly the same way that it's done now. So it's, it's exactly the same way that the property um, to the west includes the buffer, and it's a restriction on the use of that land. So there's, instead of the 80, it's a 70. The 
sizes of the lots are not much different either. Everyone's saying, oh, these are such small lots, but these are very similar to the same lots. The reason that the developer has come before you is because he hasn't been able to develop. Costs have gone up, value of lots have gone down. This was in 2006 at the height of the market. That is the reason for the change. Also, there are some benefits to the city to allow this. You do get right of way, and it's right of way that can be used should the city ever obtain possession of that road. And they do get an improvement in the water system for this loop that's going to be constructed by the developer. There's concerns about the stormwater and the runoff. Again, these are development requirements by your code that will be done at site plan. The developer cannot have more runoff after development than they have pre-development. So it will be retained. That's why there's larger retention ponds, because stormwater requirements have changed since 2006. So that's why there's more retention ponds. Um, regarding the trees, there's been no tree survey done because there are, there are trees, and tree surveys aren't, surveys are not required at the zoning stage. They're required at site plan stage or master sketch stage or different stages. And your, um, your code has some provisions, but because development standards have changed so much because of flooding and stormwater and runoff, there has to be more fill brought in so not all trees can be saved. I don't believe any developers really want, well, I can't say that. They try to save trees if they can. Most times it's not too possible because you have to bring in 18 inches of dirt and trees don't survive. Um, regarding also this plan uh, that everyone seems so enamored with, it has two accesses on JJ Road, which no one wants. Um, that has been very clear to the developer. Uh, so that plan, although they're saying, yes, it's great now, that's not really what they, they now want. Um, the 2006 plan was a long time ago. I don't know if this is the plan that was submitted to the city or the county. I don't see it anywhere in the staff report. I think they said they had trouble finding which one it was. Uh, but this is just not feasible any longer. Um, regarding the two units to the acre, uh, these sizes are compatible with lots on the, well, they're more compatible. The, the sizes are all over the place to the west side of US-1, which is not that far from this property. And I do um, want to take you back to the March 6, 2019 Planning and Zoning Commission, which is part of the reason the developer agreed to change to 143 lots. Um, the, note that the minutes that we received from the city, which I assumed have been approved by you, said that uh, member Seavers would support Res 2, which would allow up to 143 units and is compatible with the surrounding area. Member Richardson said he thinks 140 units would be fair, and 112 units is too much of a reduction. And Chairman Williams said he would put a cap at 143 units and put the original agreed buffers in place. Um, some of the buffers have been included, um, not quite to the extent, but to the extent that could be done with the retention that's required. So with that, we would ask that you approve the comp plan amendment and the PD rezoning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So can I bring a few things up? In the buffers, it was discussed that um, Part of that buffer includes the backyards of the residents. And so essentially, is that meaning that if they want to do anything in their backyard, those residents um, can't? They won't be able to build in it, no. It'll right. be a, a deed restriction of the homeowner association like they do with a lot of easements. Right. Drainage easements and things. Um, on the roadway, um, what was how many feet of easements was that? that was it, it was an easement on the, for the roadway? Um, the developer is going to dedicate 10, 10 extra feet, feet right, of road feet. right of way and on so, this property. So the idea is is that maybe at a later date, if you're saying the city takes ownership and then they want to pave and widen it five feet or make it 50 feet all the way down, that is a possibility now? Yes, sir. Okay, and that, that, is, that was a reasonable accommodation to uh, an agreement that you made with staff Correct. To accommodate the, the local road issue. Um, on the um, is there a current cap on the property? Current cap yes. of development? 
Um, yes, I mean, I was going to ask the city on this because we keep on talking about 112, but we talk about I the believe. developer's agreement expired. Well, the I, I, zoning is PUDZ, but. I believe it's PUDZ with a 12, 112 unit cap, but it's not a binding development plan like Right, you, and so what I'm trying to get at on that is we keep on talking about 112 cap, but is there a true cap on that zoning? I, I believe there, if, that, that's really for staff, but I understood there was. But, um, so it goes back to, if he was to say fine, I'm trying to understand the cap issue because we keep on going with 112 that, and that's my understanding if he was to develop under the old plan but we can't find the paperwork for the old plan and so I'm trying to understand part of it is under planning and zoning commission is we we have to make some assumptions what has been the change that is needed to increase the density in this. What is the significant change? The other part is, is the current zoning usable? And, and so, yes, we talked about making some of the, the 143 cap at the one meeting. We also talked about increasing the buffers, but I also said, look, I wouldn't care how much you increased it if you had access to US-1. Um, that, that would be a dream for me and but that is not the case. I think he's mentioned that he tried to acquire this, but um, it's not uh, doable. So I'm just trying to understand is, from your perspective, is, is it 112? If he does, if we do nothing, what is possible? If we do nothing, can he do more? Can he do it more with PUDZ, you know? I don't know, and I guess, and I planned on asking staff, but I wanted to give you the, I wanted to ask you first so that I give you that opportunity to. Right. The PUD zoning is a very unique zoning in your code, and that was, was agreed to in 2006 when the markets were different, when everything was different. Your land development code was different, your PUDZ zoning was different, and that came in with open space. He could have come in with straight zoning, which required no open space. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't believe that that Village 1 and Village 2 will ever be built. If this is denied, they will come back with straight zoning, is my opinion. Hmm. Right. And then you won't have the opportunity to get the additional right-of-way, the sewer, the water changes, and, and things along those lines, the retention, the saving of the wetlands. I mean, he could, in theory, obliterate all the wetlands and mitigate them, which no one wants. So, I mean, develop this... <clears throat> I, I know I've said this at least 10 times, but this is what your staff recommended. This is what your staff wanted. Um, I don't know if it was a staff member that left. I don't know if it was Mr. Parrish. I, I don't know, but it was, I, I believe Trevor was the one that, that Mr. Genoni had worked with initially. But so when an applicant goes through all this process and, and, and relies upon what staff says, it's, it's very difficult to then come back and say, what, what if? But that's what likely would happen is, and, and again, as I said, the PUD zoning, if, he, if, if that's what he is stuck with, he has to come back, he has six more public hearings with all the requirements under that old PUDZ zoning, which I think is why your staff changed it because it was, it's incomprehensible how many steps you have to go through to get that. <coughs> my opinion. Staff will probably tell you different, but that was my opinion. Okay. Any questions of Mrs. Rosenko? Thank you. Thank you. All right, so, and that was the last card, correct? Yes, sir. So we will close this item with the public, bring it back for the board, and I have questions of staff. The same questions. First question would be, all right, question is regarding wetlands. So how do you calculate the density of units per acre on the wetlands on the land? We say that there is eight units that, is it eight usable unit or unusable units? Or is it eight seven? Eight unusable acres? Acres, yeah, sorry. Sorry. Right. Here's why, and so I'll frame it to make, to give you understanding. So because we're wrapping this up in a planned um, development, or even a, a PUDZ, it's, it's all encompassing um, development. When we break out other um, density units per acre, and we look at uh, other things, we say it's five units, for every five units, you get 
one unit uh, density units. For uh, open space, I don't know, maybe it's three units or one unit for every three acres, correct? Something like that. So what I'm asking is, is when you look at these planned unit developments, do you, do you calculate everything and you give density units across the board on for everything, including areas that they can't use? In a planned development, the answer is yes. And the reason is that there is an incentive, we hope, to move off of the wetland, to build on a non-wetland area, and to preserve the wetland. The other option would be to come in with a regular, I hate to use the word regular, but with a different zoning. And then it would be a decision of if, if it continues in its conservation, which some of these are currently in conservation, then they would be able to get one unit per five acres with a conditional use permit. Right. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing that up, and, and I understand the whole idea is to, it's a give and take um, when you can do this. But at the same time, it is always nice to know what is the extreme cap say one more thing. We have a developer right now who has come in for an approval, has, I believe, a sketch plat completed, and has shown no development in the wetlands area. Right. Their intent is to go to the water management district, get a permit, um, modify those wetlands, and then come back to the city and say, these are no longer wetlands. Right. Are there, uh, Which means that they will then those wetlands, if the water management district permits that, will be gone. Right, and, and so, the, and that's what I, I've seen. You have certain wetlands that we know that are not gonna survive, and they're degraded wetlands, okay? It's, it's kind of disturbing that you can create a situation that you know that they're doing that, and then they're going to degrade the wetlands to where they don't have to mitigate. But then again, sometimes I, you know, I, even I agree. Years ago, I was on board 100%. Let's save 100% wetlands. Let's, and, and after doing it for a while, I mean, we're saving wetlands that, we were saving wetlands that were not going to be viable. And, and so I, I would say, you know, on some of those things, I have changed my position. Uh, save what you can save. Don't save what you can save. There is a give and take. But at the end of the day, on this, I, I would like to know that if we were looking at density credits per acre, and I have 71 acres, is that correct? Yep. And, I, and yes, eight sir. of these, I'm, I was to say, were wetlands. And I'm just, when I'm doing the, the math on that, it's still substantial, it's more than 112, but it was maybe 134 units at a cap. I don't know, probably more, maybe a 143. I, I mean, don't know, but uh, my point is, is that um, it concerns me with um, planned developments because you don't know, you know, what the acreage, acreage is. And then I'm looking at, in the beginning, I said, what was the units or the lands next to it? And I said, it doesn't seem right. And then uh, Ms. Burson got up here and discussed uh, that it's really six, seven units per acre. And so that's why I'm saying it, it is, uh, major difference. If I could, I believe what Ms. Burson is talking about is that the lots themselves are 6,000 square feet. Yes. So six times six, 36,000. 6, yeah, seven units, right. That. But that is that, and we don't look at what the development with only the lots because you have to put roads in, yes. you have to, so that's where the difference in the density is. Yes, these are 6,000 square foot lots, but the density over the development is two units an acre. For all, everything, including yes, wetlands. Yes, sir. If you take 71 and multiply it by two. No, I, and I get that. That's I'm how just we saying that. Yes, sir. <laughs> but all right, anyway, all right, so moving on. Um, on the roadway, back to the roadway. And this goes hand in hand with what it can sustain. So we know that there was a um, traffic study done, is that correct? Yes, sir, I've been told that tonight. All right, so one of the issues 
that concerns me is can the roadway sustain that more, much more development? We know that we're, we have 112 approved, and then now we're saying we're looking at, was it 143, correct? Yes, sir. And so I, I don't know if you were to say there's four trips extra a day, is there? It's, it, I, the number I heard was about 300. Well, no, I'm saying per unit, per house. Oh. I can't remember. Each, each house is about nine trips a day. Okay. And that includes, let me give you an example. The mailman is tw two trips, one in and one out. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't mean nine new cars. That's, you count. Yes, I, I understand. But so what I'm, the reason why I'm saying that is at what point is the braking level? Um, so if we were to say, fine, this is a local road, it is at this point, when if we were to look at concurrency, although we're not looking at concurrency, right? But if we were, we would maybe give this a C, okay? And would this put this at an F level? And, and that's so I'm saying, are we gonna break the bank? And I, we know that there's 112, but how much can it go up before it does nothing? Or does it? I was told this evening that the traffic study showed that it did not go above the concurrency. Uh, now, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that you look at in traffic studies. You just don't look at the total number of trips. You have to look at turning. You have to look at all kinds of the way that the the road functions. It's not just a matter of how many trips are there. Mm -hmm. That's why developments are required to put on turn in turn lanes and stacking and because it's there's more to it than just the total number of trips. So I can believe that US-1 doesn't need improvements, but I do question, like I, I can generally say I don't go to JJ Road. I've probably been in, in the 20 something years I've lived here, I've probably did, been down JJ Road twice, maybe. I don't know, not even, okay? But so I'm not a person that can say that I know, but I was surprised that uh, there's as much traffic to the um, to the park, but but I'm not surprised because you look at the map and then you say, okay, JJ Road's a viable road; people are using it. Um, but the problem I have is, is this too much for that road to handle? Do we need to? And I'm not saying this to to kill anything because it's no matter what, it's 112. No matter what, there's going to be development at some point. But the number for me is is 143 acceptable. Will the road handle that? Um, and then the last thing was bringing up the buffers. And I do have a concern about encompassing the buffers back to the back of the building, although in truth he is giving exactly what he said he's giving. The problem with that is that it's taking from the current homeowner. Um, so they can't really do much with the backyard. But um, if the buffer is up to the back of the house, can you put anything, what can you put back of there? I know you can't put anything permanent. Can you put a shed in a buffer? I don't think so, but I don't know, maybe. What the, this is a deed restriction. I would have to see the deed restriction. I have not done that. I, I can tell you that the specific language that we received is in the report, and I, it said, the buffer distance from the rear setback to the property line to 70 feet along the north and east property line as outlined on the plan. Well, I'm asking this too because you have um, houses or potential property owners that may want to put a, a pool, may want to put a shed, may want to uh, do something else. And I don't know if the buffer is the to the edge that they can't do anything. They couldn't even put a patio in there. And that would be it. Let's say that that's true. Then the person who purchases that, we hope, is aware of the deed restrictions required mm -hmm. on that property. However, so. what was described to, tonight, I heard, was building to lot line, which tells me that a pool may not be considered a building. But if you put uh, Well, a, I thought that it, it the pool is, I mean, you see people have to come in, but is it, I thought that people have to come in when they're, we've seen three feet. Uh, but just because you have to get a permit doesn't mean it's a building. A fence has a permit, but it's not a building. No. But so we have 
you know, there's certain requirements, but again, I have not seen the deed restriction. Right. So I would have so, to ask but the specifics. This is part of the concession, I guess, to, um, I guess, work. But the, the problem I have is in the development, it creates a future situation. I know that I, and I recall saying, cap it at 143, but increase the buffers. Realistically, when I'm saying this, I know that it would be difficult to get 143 with those type of buffers in that. But you, you could be very creative, but um, so realistically, I thought, okay, 143 with the buffers, it would shrink it down more. But um, I'm just, what is the city's position on that? You're comfortable with the buffers like that? The, where they're using the backyards to include, I mean, you're the head honcho. You are the person, the boss, top you want, person. It, there's so. a difference between my personal opinion and what the code says. The code allows it. Mm -hmm. My personal opinion is that it is problematic if you are requiring maintenance of, um, if you're requiring maintenance of landscaping, if you're saying, because people will not necessarily in, um, maintain landscaping to a certain standard. So if that were a required landscape buffer, then I would suggest that it go into a common area so that the homeowners association could maintain it. Because we usually get a little bit better um, out of a homeowners association my attorney over here who deals with code enforcement may disagree with me, but I would rather see it in it. But if it is just an open space and it is a deed restriction, then I think it's buyer beware. But that's but, just my opinion. That, that's not the code, the code allows it. You see people coming for um, variances and for- You do, but that's from setbacks, not from code. Yeah, that's true. Because we right. do not enforce code those deed restrictions. Right. Now, if it's in, let me clarify. If that were put in the language of the PD so that the measurement were clear, we would then enforce that. But if it is only a deed restriction, it is not enforced by but, the city. So, but, okay, unless it's put in the PD, uh, then what guarantees do they, what guarantees are any agreements then? For the well, whatever language you see in this PD is what the staff is going to live with. Well, so, I mean, what I did see is, and, and I guess I didn't look at the specific, I was looking yeah, at the, the language, and right. I didn't look at the writing on. Right, the words matter. Right. So what this talks about is what the principal structure setbacks are and what the accessory structure setbacks are. But it are. doesn't bring in the buffers, is that what you're saying? I'm, I mean, it, I'm saying I've got way too right. much paper, so give me a um, minute. Because my understanding is buffers were important. Um, so, okay. you know, you know that you're going to get a standard buffer, but if the agreement is 70 feet, how do you get that if you're saying we're going to put it in a deed it, restriction? This is what, this is... Uh, because the staff enforces the words on this page, mm -hmm. it says under 1.7 that the floor area is 1,200 square feet. It gives us a lot width and a lot area, mm -hmm. a maximum building height, maximum building coverage, and a maximum impervious coverage. Now, I understand what it says on this um, plan but I believe it would be to everyone's advantage if that is the agreement to put those words into the PD ordinance. It's in 1.11. It is? Oh, good, thanks. Oh, yes, a 20-foot perimeter what? landscape buffer will be established. A 20-foot? Then wait, along the northern and eastern boundaries, a minimum 70-foot buffer shall be established between the perimeter of the development and the property line of every single family lot. Page so, 59 of your agenda packet. Right. right. So we would implement the 70-foot buffer between the perimeter of the development and the property line of any single-family lot within the development. 
Now, okay, so along the northern. That's not. That's region. not from building to building as I read it. No. So, that it's, is okay. So, that is from you said lot line. It says, from between the perimeter of the development and the property line of any single family lot. All right. So. So With the exceptions words, of two lots, 30 and 31. The, this, the scale of that isn't, of the map wouldn't be correct, and it would shrink in. I'm hoping I'm reading it. I'm hoping I'm getting this right, because it sounds like he's I doing exactly what he said he was going to do. Oh, yeah, we still, yes. If it's that, to the property line, not to the building. This says to the, this says between the perimeter of the development and the property of any single mm -hmm. family lot within the development. The perimeter of the development to, but is it the, here's the why I'm asking this. When you say perimeter of development, are you talking about the house edge or are you talking about the property line? To me, the perimeter of the development means the, uh, the east, eastern, western, north, south yeah. of, the, of this large 71 acre development to the property line of any single family lot. That's what, how I read that. Mr. Chairman, yep. there's, in, unfortunately, there's inconsistencies in several different locations. The recommended action uh, is uh, 70 feet measure to uh, the this, this setback line. It's not the same thing as that's in the uh, plan development ordinance. Thank you for catching that. <laughs> In addition, the master plan says something entirely different. That is, it says, uh, it shows clearly that 20 feet of the setback is a part of the 70 feet. So, I mean, I wh could, whatever, whatever's done, it needs to be clear one, one way or the other. I, I could understand because it's saying a 20 foot, um, it says a 20 foot uh, landscape buffer, which, okay, I can understand 20 feet of landscape buffer being within 70 feet. That makes sense, but. Um, but then I say, is it lot line to, and then to lot line? That's how I read perimeter of the development and property line. Okay. All right, Mr. Sievers, you had some questions? Um, it seems to me that uh, the threshold issue is uh, the uh, comprehensive plan amendment. I have no, uh, as I stated in March, had no problem with um, utilizing the county's uh, comprehensive plan of residential alt two. However, in the March meeting, I talked a lot about also the conservation element portion as well. And I am very concerned and, and Mr. Mr. Uh, Chairman, you talked a lot about numbers, and numbers are very important, and uh, whether or not you include uh, land as in conservation uh, of eight acres or nine acres or whatever it is, uh, versus uh, having it as residential two makes a difference. Because, for example, and I, there's two different numbers in, as to how many acres we have, the Atlantic report says 69.25 acres based upon the survey. What we have in our agenda is 71.76 acres. Uh, assuming for the moment that it's a 71.76 and there's 8.72 acres of wetlands, I see also another place that's 8.2, but that leaves about 63 acres in the R uh, to our, our residential two category, <laughs> multiplying that times two, it's 126 units. If the other land, the wetlands, is in conservation OR, then that's theoretically two units. That is uh, one unit per five acres. That uh, would make a total of 128 units. If so I could. Mr. Sievers, you asked the question as to what is the total number in the OR and conservation. 
Yes. According to GIS, we sent you this information, it was 5.72 acres. And I believe if you will notice that there is, there's a couple of small wetlands on the property that have not been designated as conservation. So if you're using that theory of what's conservation, I think we're closer to 5.72, six acres as opposed to eight. Well, also what you provided to me that there is 9.366 total acres of wetlands. Yes, sir. And, um, and uh, 1.035 were being impacted. Yes, sir. I subtract those two numbers <laughs> and I get uh, about 8.2 acres that are not impacted. And since, but not, not all of those are in conservation. That was my only point to right. you. And it's since now we have ground truthing, as contemplated by our uh, future land use element, I assume we're talking about uh, 9.36 or 8.2 would be in conservation because we're ground truth. We have the information. Well, again, the code says that you put anything in five acres or greater into conservation. So it would have to be, um, it would not necessarily be automatic that those smaller wetlands would go into conservation, although um, council could choose to do that, but it is not automatic. Well, I'm looking at page six of the report, which is at page 36 which says in order to provide more accurate mapping of wetlands, when the city receives a wetland delineation on civic sites, the delineation will be accepted by the city, which now we have. The conservation land use shall be amended to include all wetlands on the site. Doesn't say all wetlands in excess of five acres. To be preserved, that's what, this is the amended language that staff prepared last year unless such wetlands are preserved by a conservation easement as a part of a PD. I'm just reading from your staff report. So I read that literally as to what it says. That is, since we now have ground truthing, then 8 point, really 9.366 acres is in conservation, unless it's going to be a part of a conservation easement. And I really would ask the legal department and staff to rethink the answer that I got earlier because we have amended the comprehensive plan to expressly reference a conservation easement and a PD in the comprehensive plan. And you're saying we cannot attach that as a condition of the approval. And I don't understand because I can just tell my fellow commissioners, I can't vote for uh, changing it to residential two, two for the entire site and throw out conservation without that protection. I would still want conservation land use protected because I realize, as everybody realizes, they could come in with a new application tomorrow for something different. And if it's on comprehensive plan as conservation, it's there. So getting back to my, what I said, we fundamentally first have to decide whether or not uh, we want to uh, vote in favor or against amending the comprehensive plan. Uh, I'll be repetitious. I have no problem supporting a motion to approve amending and recommending approval to change the comprehensive plan to uh, residential two with conservation of 9.366 acres as you have provided me based upon ground truthing being designated as conservation. Alternatively, I probably can support the other motion if we can attach a condition. If I could, Mr. Seavers, yes. uh, I'd like to read strategy 1.6.3.2 of the conservation element. Okay. At a minimum, wetlands five acres or more in size shall be designated as a conservation land use and wetlands less than five acres will be subject to review to determine what protection, if any, 
they should receive from development. Such review shall be based on the functional value criteria specified in 1.6.4. If based on this determination protection is warranted, development may be permitted based upon criteria set forth in the environmental performance standards of the land development regulations. That was the point when I said that it was not automatic that those five acres, that any wetland less than five acres. So I was simply going by what this says. Again, council, of course, can do as they wish, but that's the policy I was referring to. Okay. We, we seem to have two inconsistent uh, provisions of the plan as we've had in the past. If that Here. were the only one in that plan, <laughs> I would be so pleased. <laughs> But unfortunately, we have several. <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Yes. To answer the question by Member Sievers regarding adding a condition, I would suggest that you may do so, but we'll have to look at it, and I don't know whether uh, we will take some time to research and review that, and I'd recommend that it's possible that you go ahead with, if you're inclined to make a motion with a condition. We just can't guarantee that council will be able to adopt whatever conditions you suggest tonight. What if you make a separate motion? Is that what you're saying? Make a separate. What if we were to make a separate motion for council to consider or something? Uh, I'll, whatever you want to do. <laughs> so was that it, Mr. Sievers? Do you have more? Uh, no, I think we need to address the comprehensive plan issue first. Ms. Sarah, did you have anything? I see your mic is on. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I wanted to go back to the, um, just so if, I wanted to go back to the current, if we were to do nothing, what, what gives this a cap of 112? How do they maintain, we keep talking about 112, but what, what actually maintains it at 112? Is the PUDZ, um, because it's a zoning, um, what is capping it at 112? Now it, that the development agreement would have expired. To the best of staff's understanding, and the old files were difficult, there is a 112 unit maximum it is the master plan itself, which seems to be of some, which seems to be problematic as to the layout, the specific layout. And because of the process that would be required, that master plan would be required to come back through the public hearing process. So though the specific layout of the 112 uh, units could then come back through the public hearing process. Um, all right. So. And I, I, I'm just asking, can you refresh my mind? What is the current future land use map on this? Uh, PUD. The, the land use is the same as the zoning. That was the way that it was done in the old days. All right, well, um, okay, here's why I'm asking this. What can you put on PUD zoning wise? Each PUD is separate. In this case, the PUD is limited to 112 units. Well, no, no, what I'm saying is, let's just say that he, he says, look, because borrowing the future land use map, okay? And he says, all right, fine, I'm gonna go get a different zoning. I'm gonna apply for a different zoning. How would you respond to, if he just said, I don't need, I'm not gonna go for a comprehensive plan amendment. I just want a new zoning. What could he go for? He has to get a comprehensive plan amendment in order to change to a street. Because the two are tied together no yes, matter what, sir. inseparable. That's correct. And, but it seems odd. I, I mean, I'm just saying that because PUD doesn't give uh, the density uh, or intensity, I guess. Uh, with the max intensity. That's correct. And that's one reason that the staff is looking at, that's one reason staff is looking at this differently. That's why we recommended that a PD would be permitted and that you would look at the density at the future land use at a maximum. So we are trying to head to 
what you're suggesting you might feel more comfortable with, which is two units an acre or whatever the density is at the future land use stage. And then the PUDZ is where the mass, the PD, I'm sorry, is yes. where the master plan. But in the way that the code was written and implemented in 2006, a PUDZ stands for zoning was only approved in the PUD land use. Okay. Um, all right, I'm just trying to, you know, look at if there was any other possibilities for them minus the CPA and um, plus I was trying to figure out why, how is it being tied to 112, but if everything else expired. All right, um, here's my thoughts, just real quick. And so I know we've talked about this for two and a, well, at least two hours, so I don't know, maybe more, but I mean, you know, I obviously wanna make everybody happy, but you're not, you're not gonna be able to make everybody happy, but um, you know, I, the, the overall cap is a concern for me. Um, of is 143 too much? You know, is 112 not enough for him to develop? Um, so I, I did go through the, I even asked for the council minutes and one of the things, and I find this a fallacy a lot of times when developers, and nothing against Ms. Um, Chad, but they seem to start off up here, always up at the top. And, you know, if, if, if I do that at everything and, you know, we we seem to say, okay, fine, 150 it is, you know? When in fact, the play is always 112, you know? But I agree, you know, this is, it came in in 2006, conditions change, markets change, um, everybody wants to make the most bang for their buck, but in doing so, you also have to consider the residents that are, that are currently there. Um, and so I would suggest, and I, obviously, obviously I can't make the motion because I'm the chairman, but I would suggest that we try to accommodate some of, find a middle ground. It was brought up at council, you know, about what is the numbers, and I think it's uh, Diesel brought that up about what is the absolute number, but, um, but in, you know, I think the commission needs to make that number of a recommendation. We have to make a recommendation towards the, um, Mr. S you know, Mr. Sievers brought up about the environmental issues with the wetlands. Um, am I missing anything? Traffic. And traffic, obviously traffic with the road, yes. Um, and that was an, another major concern of mine is what was the threshold that it's going to break the bank, you know? Um, so, I turn it over to you guys. And I see my lights aren't lit up, so, so, uh, And, and I know that we've we've gone through this over and over again, and we've hashed it out. It's a it's a not easy, Mr. Sievers. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to make uh, two two uh, separate motions. Uh, the first one is that uh, the City uh, Planning and Zoning Commission recommend to the City Council that the uh, comprehensive plan on this subject parcel be amended or changed to um, uh, residential two with the provision that um, 8.331 acres as identified by the applicant based upon ground truthing uh, be designated as uh, conservation in the balance as uh, as residential two, and I arrived at the 8.331 based upon what staff had given me that there's a total of 9.366 acres 
I subtracted from it uh, 1.035 uh, total impacts, getting the 8.331 acres. I'll, I'll second that, mess, that uh, motion. All right, so on, you know, just for clarification, I know we have a motion and a second. What would be the cap on this with the residential two? With two units an acre on all oh, of the that, property. All right, I'm sorry. <laughs> then I don't understand the question. So if it's R2, how would the calculations be on this? Two units an acre times the number of acres. Minus Well, I don't have math. In, I don't have it in front of me, but um, se 71.7 minus 8.33 is right, so pretty close to 68.3 or something, or something like that. Right. Yeah. All right. And then that's where. All right. All right. So can we t take a vote on this? Member Richardson. Yes. Secretary Chambers. Um, yes. Member Spidell? Yes. Member Seavers? Yes. Member Hare? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. Okay, next motion. You said you had two motions, so. <laughs> uh, just for the record, I, I'm not going to make it as a motion. Uh, I'm willing to consider or Certainly, I know staff will inform council that uh, we would, at least as one commissioner, be willing to consider if I could attach a condition to uh, the uh, change in the land use to R2 with the condition that 8.331 acres be set aside as a uh, conservation easement. As per... 8.331? 8.331 as per policy 1.16.2 of the future land use element. That, that's just my <laughs> perspective. Are you making the motion? No, I'm not making the motion. No. Okay. That's just my. <laughs> you were ready to second it, weren't you? Yeah. You're like, second. <laughs> 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 I agree. Yeah, it does. All right. So there you have it. Hopefully. Now we got to go to the so Could I oh, just, ahead. in order to um, explain this, I heard a kind of a consensus, even though there was no motion, that, that people would support that. Because I will get asked. You I see heads going up and down. All right. Great. Thanks. Who all agrees? And who, who doesn't disagree? So, all right. I think. Okay. Good Thank concerns. you. That'll be helpful. <clears throat> okay. All right. So. Said that uh, we're going to go over the zoning. Yeah, that's why. Mr. Severs? Oh, sure. So, uh, you want to make a motion on zoning? I'll take the gavel. Thank her. No, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm staying in my box. I'm not reluctant to speak, okay? Um, I understand both sides of this discussion and argument, uh, whatever you want to call it. And there's merits on both sides uh, to the uh, discussion. Uh, from day one, I was amazed or surprised we would think about putting PD on JJ Road because it, you drive down the road, it, this type of <coughs> subdivision just doesn't fit. I mean, it just doesn't. And the counter to that for me is I like PD in the sense that you have some uh, conservation uh, and set aside of land and some recreational improvement. 
That's a positive thing. Uh, what I don't know, if you had a conventional subdivision, uh, we're talking about 35% of the land is set aside. If we take out the, uh, uh, the perimeter 20-foot uh, uh, buffer around the outside and you take out the uh, wetlands and you take out the, uh, the uh, retention area, is that 20%, 30% of the site already anyway? So how much advantage is there to the PD? And, and I've always had, and perhaps uh, I have a fundamental issue with the PD ordinance in allowing <laughs> retention ponds to be counted as conservation at, as such. I just have a fundamental elementary problem with that. And I realize the code says that. So that calls for changing the code. Uh, because I don't think it accomplishes the intent and purpose of the PD, which is something much better than the conventional uh, ordinances uh, as such. So, uh, um, in addition, uh, I, I know this is a sidelight, but since November, I've been commenting about the 2040 comprehensive plan and I listed two items I didn't think the plan adequately addressed. One, protection of the area of critical concern, and number two, the Indian River Lagoon. And all those people that are now appearing, we're talking about the, uh, the comprehensive plan. You better show up for the Indian River Lagoon if that's your intention. So, uh, I just don't feel as though this type of development fits on JJ Road. And if necessary, I can go through uh, the grounds of reasons for that. I haven't made a motion. Other people should speak and uh, say whatever they want. But uh, I just don't feel this type of development is consistent in addition, frankly, if there's 12 areas of wetlands on this property, wow, there must be some serious drainage wet area on this property and the impacts downstream are going to be significant. That's just common sense. You don't need to be an engineer to figure that one out. It's just common sense. And uh, uh, it's good in a way that you have uh, this extra area as, as uh, open space. However, by concentrating the all the development together the way this does, you're going to have that much more runoff rather than if you have one unit, uh, two units per acre scattered out, you're not going to have the concentrated runoff that is going to occur uh, with regard to uh, this type of development. So I don't, uh, certainly as I supported the concept of PD on Park Avenue, <laughs> Park Avenue development did not uh, change the conservation portion. Matter of fact, they added to the conservation portion. Here they're trying to take some of that uh, conservation away to count it for units. So. I have a problem with uh, this development in this location for lots of reasons. Um, so here's my thoughts. And, and I know that it was brought up. So in 2006, it came in under, and it was approved. Now I know what was said was, you know, making the mistake twice. But the problem is, is that you can't go back in time and undo what was already given. And um, so he is entitled to, to develop this. The closest thing to this is PD, of what was previously approved. The other part of this, and, uh, and I would defer to staff, is that to suggest something else is, in my opinion, a little bit more problematic, considering it already went to the state. But I know it's zoning, so, um, but either way, you know, if there's a workable zoning that the commission or staff 
would suggest that it would be more appropriate, I'm all ears. But like I said, that, um, you know, this was, you can't go back in time and, and say, okay, we never did that. And this was given, it is a done deal. And so now it's trying to um, keep, in my opinion, it's trying to keep the original promises as close to what was promised. Um, and that is what I'm hoping for. But changing zoning definitely does that. PD gives the city more flexibility um, to uh, work that. So is there any other suggestions, Mr. Saka, that you would, uh, what is your thoughts? My thoughts are that um, without re-advertising, typically you're only allowed to recommend something that's less intensive. Yes. So that what recommendation would then be difficult, I think, because if you go with a straight subdivision, you do not get the same type of open space that you have now. You do have larger lots and fewer homes. There. So if you look at intensity based on lot size, then you could suggest something with um, half acre lots, three quarter acre, whatever lots you wanted. If you looked at something as intensity with um, buffers, if you go to a straight subdivision, you may not get the buffers that you have now you would get the typical buffer that's required. If you look at intensity based on open space, then you should not expect much open space in a regular subdivision. So I do not know how to recommend to you until you tell me how you decide what less intense is. So you were saying that um, here's where we can make recommendations, correct? All right, so if we were to say PD with the original buffers, the intensity on that with um, the same language, I mean, I think that the map that was presented might not be um, to scale, but if there was a 70-foot buffer with a 20-foot in there, it, it does, in my opinion, push push that out a bit. Um, I don't know if you're rightfully gonna get that many units. I, I don't know, my thoughts are it, it is becomes less intensive. I mean, you're, what are so you? So your thought is that the larger buffers make it less intensive? I think, I mean, I think it helps um, with the original agreement. I think um, with the reduced scale already, I mean, who's gonna, shrink it a bit? I don't even know without more assistance and my learned colleague might be able to help me whether you can make this recommendation and expect it to go forward based on the advertising. Honestly, it would just be, well, what I'm I'd saying, have to think about the it. The buffers. Um, the, my suggestion if I could is, would work. is if you're going to, if you like the PD, then recommend a PD with X number of buffers and X number of units and let the developer figure out how that master plan lays out. But, so then, how is there an advertising issue then? Well, you can't. I mean, you just said. You, I'm, it, it, this has been advertised for PD so if you, if you go to a PD, then it meets the advertisement. If right. you decided to go to um, RR1, which was suggested, said, no. <laughs> then okay. I don't, I have to think right. about what that right. means. I, I don't know. Right, and I was talking about PD okay. because that's so, what I said, was PD okay. with, with uh, enhanced buffers. Okay, so my suggestion and is to make that recommendation of you want, you'd like to see PD and tell us exactly how, what the buffers are and how big you want them. And then if you have an issue as to number of units, All I'm doing then I would cap the number of units. soliciting somebody to make a. <laughs> 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 but uh, I'm just, you know, I think that um, 
you know, I think the, in, uh, the buffers, the original agreed upon buffers um, with PD, um, the future land use change. Now, bear in mind, and we're doing all this, and it could be very well moot because it gets to council, and they're like, nope, we like it, done. All right, we're good. <laughs> so I'm saying by putting all of this thought in this, it may mean nothing. So, Based on the prior motion that was made by the commission to reduce the total allowable number of units, I would recommend that the commission um, have staff look at the language of the body of the rezoning ordinance to make the necessary changes that would be consistent with the comprehensive plan amendment. Um, for example, the 1.5 states there's a maximum of 143 single family residential units. I'm not sure that that would be consistent with the prior motion. I don't think it would be. I think that there's also section 1.11 buffering slash screening that currently states, as Peggy read earlier, along the northern and eastern property boundaries, a, mi a minimum 70 foot buffer shall be established between the perimeter of the development and, no. the, uh, just, no. and the property line of any single family lot within the development with the exceptions of lots 30 and 31. If you would like that to be clarified with additional language, Chair Williams, that's a possibility and that was the, the staff does have to revise this ordinance. I would just say that I don't know exactly what you meant by original buffers. Well, but okay. I at thought one it was time there was a buffer that was a landscape that required 90 feet on the north, oh. 80 feet on the east, and a 36 foot conservation easement on individual lots. So I don't know if that's what you meant by original buffer. Yeah, I mean, and it's, it's, uh, I know that that's problematic. Uh, Mr. Sievers. Try to move things along. I'm going to make a motion, Let's see what happens. Uh, move that uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended denial of the PD, um, uh, the rezoning to uh, PD as uh, submitted on the following grounds or reasons. One, uh, the proposed rezoning to PD would be inconsistent with the comprehensive plan as we have recommended to be amended in that it would not allow 143 units, as council just pointed out. Uh, number two, that the uh, application does not comply with section 33-5 or in two of the code as far as being located on an arterial or collector street. Number three, that the um, existing zoning is uh, presumed correct and substantial change has not been just uh, demonstrated that uh, that the original zoning cannot be uh, developed uh, and the burden of proof is upon the applicant to prove that. Uh, next item that the density or intensity of the proposed rezoning request is not consistent with the development in the area, which is primarily, the actual zoning is primarily one unit per acre in the area, except for the very northwest corner, uh, which are half acre lots. Number four, the application, uh, excuse me, that the uh, five, There has not been demonstrated uh, compliance with item number seven, which is on page uh, 40 of our, as to uh, demonstration that there's substantial reason why the property cannot be used in the existing zoning district. So that would be my motion. Okay, is there a second? Okay, I'll do it. I'll second it. Okay. Okay. We have a. Motion and a second, and we have a roll call on this. Member Spidell? Uh, yes. Member Hare? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Uh, yes. Member Severs? Yes. Member Richardson? 
Yes. Chairman no. Williams. No. And my reasonings are that um, I understand that by approving the CPA portion of that, now it's we've uh, in not approving this, we've made it totally incompatible. Um, and I don't believe that that is acceptable to the applicant. I think that we need to um, come to some consensus to be able to uh, allow them to use the property. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, I do agree with everything that Mr. C was saying. It's just I don't want to leave this in a unusable state. Okay, um, that is it. Drop the mic. <laughs> I think we're finally done. Um, appreciate everybody coming out. and appreciate your time. Um, when does this go before council? On Tuesday night, okay. the 11th. So. Um, sorry, what was that? Let's continue. Yeah, that's why we got to take fairly, a break. It's fairly quickly, and that's why he's going to say it's this last couple items are fairly quickly if we want to move on. So, all right. So, with last, what was that? Yep. Uh, elections. All right. To get into the next item on your agenda, you have elections listed. The reason for the elections at this time of the year is because you need to appoint or nominate a new vice chair. I will comment that at the last meeting, the commission decided and voted to have the chair Williams send a letter to your former vice chair. I did get that signed. I have it in front of me. It's going out in the mail tomorrow. At this time, it would be appropriate for one of the members to make a recommendation or nomination for a new vice chair to fill the vacancy. Are there any questions or do I hear a nomination? I nominate member Sievers. I'll second that. Okay. Are there any other nominations? Oh wait, there she is. <laughs> if we could just give the recording secretary a moment. We've heard a nomination for a vice chair. The motion was made by member Richardson and it was seconded by member Hare. Has there been any other nomination? Okay. Yeah, that's the other portion. Do you, yeah, do you accept this? Your nomination, Mr. Sievers. Yes, sir. Okay. Can we vote on this? Yes. Okay. Okay. Take a vote. Member Spidell. Member Richardson? Yes. Secretary Chambers? Yeah. Member Hare? Yes. Chairman Williams? Yes. Well, congratulations. All right. Um, so next is reports. Uh, I have a question on City Council summary of action. Mm -hmm. Item D under consent agenda says approval of advisability for staff to evaluate and make recommendations to council regarding community engagement procedures for land use related applications such as rezoning and comprehensive plan amendments. And I, I just want to ask what is meant by that. What the staff would like to do is give some very specific standards for when someone has to provide a report that they have met with the uh, community, that they have to provide some very specific information about the discussion in the community. We would like to provide them with more guidance. That's the applicant. Yes, sir, words. that is the applicant. 
and we would like to have a specific date so that we can get that information and make it, make it part of the package that gets to planning and zoning. All of that will come back to you, but there is a, other communities in the county which provide this information, and we thought that that would be useful. And Council Member Nelson asked you a question, would it come before us? That is correct, it okay. will. As it, because it will be an ordinance, and it will come before you. Probably after budget time? Uh, no, sir, I'm hoping to move it a little faster than okay. that. That's all I have for that. Okay, anything from the attorney's office? Anything from planning? Okay. Two things. Uh, there was some discussion this evening about open space. Council has provided a, um, a advisability that we can look at open space because the staff agrees that putting a bench and calling it open space is problematic. Um, so we are working on that. You will see that. In addition to that, there will be a workshop related to tree protection. Right now, they are thinking of a date in July. If that date is approved by council, we will send you an email next week so you can put it on your calendar if you'd like to attend. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, Member Richardson. Uh, I have just one thing I'd like to ask is, you know, there was another bad accident at the US-1 in Garden Street today. And long, uh, about six months ago, there was talk of a, um, one of those turns like they have it, Vieira? Roundabout. Roundabout, yes. What is now the plan for US-1 and Garden? Well, the city council has made it clear that they do not believe the community supports roundabouts. I agree. DOT will do what DOT <laughs> will do. So my suggestion would be that um, you go on the either the DOT website or the TPO's website, and they have a list of studies that have been completed by DOT, and you could see where that is. They but also talked about one six months ago at the corner of Garden in Singleton. Has that been nixed by the council? The council roundabout. made it clear that uh, roundabouts was not supported by this community. So again, they've done what they can to tell DOT that they do not want them. So was this something that you like roundabouts? No. Oh, okay, I was like, yeah, I hate them. I hate them myself too. And, and the statistics that we were given before, I was just like, it doesn't make sense to me, but, and then the last time I heard that we talked about them, they said the accidents are minor um, at Vieira, but there's a lot of accidents, but they're minor accidents. If I could, speed. the um, roundabout at Vieira is not the best example. I worked for the county when that was approved. Mm -hmm. It was under-designed, and I think that ev all of us have enjoyed the opportunity to hate that roundabout. Yeah. Um, so I am not. I am not suggesting that that is the best example of a roundabout. I've, I've seen roundabouts in Wisconsin and Minnesota that were pretty pretty good. They were designed good and they worked, but nowhere else. Not D.C. Not. So, okay. Is that it? Uh, yes, but I'd just add that a lot of us elderly people would stay on the roundabout for. 10 minutes. I kind of missed it. That's right. Mrs. Hare. I don't have one. Nothing from the school board? Yeah. All right. Mr. Sievers. Nothing. Mrs. Spidell. I'm glad to be here, and I learned something tonight. <laughs> and Mr. Chambers. Uh, nothing. What am I doing here? <laughs> and I, well, you know, I did want to make one comment. I actually. I had a neighbor, um, but he got hit on US-1 crossing the mall, walking through the walk, crosswalk, got hit, never saw it in the paper, never, my wife asked me, hey, you want to walk across? And I, every time I give her the same answer, no, I'm not walking across to US-1. But I mean, I was a little sad that it didn't hit the paper. I mean, this, this guy's, was, I don't know if you heard about it, but really sad story. Um, 
this guy was a decent guy. Um, he was going to go get surgery, I think, next the week after, and then he got hit walking across US-1 while he had the right of way. But, you know, sometimes it's just sad. And it's sad that um, it was overlooked. But um, anyway, that's all I had. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>